Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to collinslaststand.com. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 73. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my distant co-host, Chris Raygun. Chris, how are you today? I'm well. You sounded unsure if it was 73 or not. Yeah, I was thinking about it. You know, we don't really have to, you know, when you're on your way through a sentence, you kind of have to just get through the end. You don't really know what you're going to say. Yeah, you got to remind yourself you're alive. Exactly. I have to remind myself I'm alive. I have to do that all the time. Sometimes I wake up and I'm like, well, I'm still alive. <laughs> so here we go. For the uninitiated, Sacred Symbols is our weekly PlayStation podcast. You can support it on patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early ad free access. The ability to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas, which we read and sprinkle like a spice, like a precious spice throughout uh, the entire episode. And of course, there's Sacred Symbols Plus as well, which is our weekly supplemental podcast only for patrons. Only. Only. That's it. We just hit 7,400 patrons. Uh, lots of people are coming on board for the Sacred Symbols Plus. So we very much appreciate that. Remember, you can learn about all things Collins Last Stand, including how to buy merch and all the other things at CollinsLastStand.com and leave us nice reviews on podcast services if it pleases you. We really do appreciate it. The last episode of Sacred Symbols Plus for the Uninitiated was all about XO19, the Xbox press conference and show last week. Uh, We will be doing a mailbag coming up. And then, Chris, I sent you the schedule or my proposed schedule for the rest of the year. Uh, we will be doing pretty much back to back to back spoiler cast on Death Stranding, Fallen Order, and The Outer Worlds. Yeah. So pretty exciting stuff. Cool. Pretty exciting cool. stuff happened. Just a few corrections before we get into some preliminary uh, commentary from the audience, Chris. <laughs> Ian Stewart wrote into us. I'm not going to read what he wrote, but he did say that he got a PS View cancellation letter. We talked about last week that no one was getting these letters, or at least someone wrote in and claimed they didn't. Ian claimed that he got his in late October. Oh, so. All right. We want to be fair yeah. to everybody out there. Uh, they're not just canceling view without telling anyone. It seems like at least someone is being told uh, that this is happening. Chris, also on Sacred Symbols Plus last week, or no, I'm sorry, not on Sacred Symbols Plus last week, on Sacred Symbols last week, I can barely keep our shows straight. I talked about people going and reading or, or the fantastic Andrew Ryan interview. <laughs> the guy from Bioshock. The guy from Bioshock that I think Games Industry International did. Of course, only one person wrote in about this, by the way. So yeah. this was totally either people weren't listening to me or they realized the error or whatever. As, obviously, as Chris said, uh, Andrew Ryan is the villain in the original Bioshock. Jim Ryan is the man who I was trying to talk about. He is a real man uh, and he works uh, at PlayStation. So go check that out if you'd like. Chris, are you much of a Black Friday shopper by chance? Uh, no, yeah, no, neither. because I never really I, I don't know. I never understood the the whole trampling thing. You know, like, oh, right. 30%. Like, if it was like 90% off of like a 4K TV, like I could get, I could understand at least some level of trampolization. But like, it's always just kind of underwhelmingly, I don't know. It's just like, this is still expensive. Anything that was expensive before is still relatively expensive. Yeah, I think you're still making a profit on it. So it's got to be somewhat expensive. But yeah, listen, I know that a lot of people... Every dollar counts. And we, you and I always talk about how fastidious we are with our own money. Uh, so I'm not insulting anyone for going and trying to save money on these things. But I've always been of the mind, Chris, and I don't know if this is an accurate way of looking at it, but if you can't afford, for instance, the TV at a normal price, whatever it is, and you need that 25% discount and you got a fist fight over it, you know, to get it or like go and like, you know, trample people and whatnot, maybe you didn't need the TV to begin with. Yeah. And yeah. then you're probably going to, you know, you're going to go to the hospital and then that's a copay and an ambulance ride. Right. going to cost and, you way more. And if you don't have insurance, that ambulance ride is going to cost you 15 times how much that TV. What costs. I like to do is I like to go to go to Walmart or Best Buy during Black Friday and uh, wait by people's cars mm. and then uh, take their things as they're uh, as they're coming out of the store. Like a thief. Like that's a like good. a like a like a scoundrel. Like a scoundrel. Right. A uh, a roughshod scoundrel. Uh <laughs> On the London streets. <laughs> don't do that, by the way. That's the. <laughs> that's, I got. I feel like I have to say that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Don't. Don't actually <laughs> don't, go out don't there. Don't rob be a rough people on Black Friday, please. Don't rob anyone any day of the week. Well, yeah. Or any like, day of the year. 
<laughs> but specifically then it's probably a bad time i've always wondered what was that movie called about um the purge where like there was a day a year where you could do whatever you want that was whatever. Uh, that was the purge yeah right it's an interesting idea maybe that <laughs> maybe that would be maybe that would be when we should maybe that's when we should uh, hold black friday you know <laughs> just throw it all into idea. one just <laughs> just throw it all into <laughs> into one thing. But I brought this up. There's actually a reason I brought this up. Black Friday is creeping up, obviously, as we know. Thanksgiving is right around the corner here in the U.S. I just wanted to let everyone know on PlayStation blog, they actually revealed the pretty serious discounts they're giving everything uh, for both Black Friday and retail stores and then Cyber Monday on your online outlets of choice. These deals apparently run from November 24th through December 2nd. Um, in the U.S. and November 28th through December 6th for our Canadian listeners. And I'm only going to use U.S. MSRP. Uh, Canadian money, obviously, is worthless. We don't really care how much things cost in Canadian dollars. <laughs> so PlayStation 4 bundle. So the core PlayStation 4 bundle, you can get it for $199.99 on Black Friday. And it includes The Last of Us Remastered, God of War, and Horizon Zero Dawn. That's insane. Pretty fucking wild uh, uh, deal. In fact, those three games, if you bought them new without tax would have been $180. So the console, $199 with the three games included and the DLC for both Last of Us and uh, Horizon. If you want a PlayStation 4 Pro, you can get that for $299 uh, during Black Friday deals. Obviously, this is all as uh, supplies last at your retailer or whatever. PSVR multi-game bundles. Um, So you can get a PSVR headset, a camera, and then five games, Astrobot Rescue Mission, Skyrim VR, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, Everybody's Golf VR, and PlayStation VR Worlds for 199 bucks. That's a great deal. Yeah. Uh, you can also get PSVR Blood and Truth from Sony London and Everybody's Golf Bundle for $249.99 if you'd like, you know, more high caliber games. Uh, PSVR Gold Headset, uh, so the headset you would wear and connect to your c- controller, etc. cetera, $69.99. Uh, available in whatever colors you can find. DualShock 4, $39.99. So almost half off for that. 25% off PlayStation Plus yearly subscriptions. So that's a good deal. I'm going to get in on that. And then PlayStation exclusive games for $19.99. The following. Days Gone, Spider-Man, uh, Medieval, Concrete Genie, and The Show 19. And then other PlayStation hits are as low as $9.99 for that duration. So I just wanted to let everyone know about all of those deals for those yeah. penny pinchers out there. And hey, if you say, let's say, Chris, let's say you save $5 by buying Horizon Zero Dawn on Black Friday. There's your subscription cost for Patreon. Yeah, there you go. You know what I mean, that's clever. So you shouldn't just save the money and put it away or invest it, buy your children clothing, whatever you want to do. Just give it to us. Yeah, you don't that, need uh, you don't need your future, you know. So don't worry all, all about that. Now, I, I I say that all because we have, obviously, this is the PlayStation podcast. Most of you listening already own all of this stuff. But I know that we hear, Chris, all the time from people that actually just listen to our show because they like us for some reason and they don't even own PlayStation hardware. So <laughs> this is a good time to get involved. I mean, $200 for a core PS4 is actually a pretty good deal. Remember when we were talking to that guy a few weeks ago when he wrote in and asked if he should just wait yeah. for the PS5? I mean, at those prices, I'm not trying to be like, I'm not a Sony salesman. I don't give a fuck if you buy a PlayStation or not, really. But... It's a good deal. I mean, that's a really good deal. No, so. that's pretty undeniable, I think. So go check that out. While su- whilst supplies last, I want to say that instead. I'm not really sure what the difference is between while and whilst. But Chris, let's get into the audience inquiries. We can't avoid it any further, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a lot of corrections. There are. Sling Blade running to us. He said, hello, Colin, Kazuma, and Kiryu, Chris. Quick correction. On the X09 episode of Sacred Symbols Plus, when talking about Sega coming to Game Pass, you mentioned that Yakuza 0, Kawami, and Kawami 2 were spinoffs. However, all three are mainline entries. Yakuza 0 is a prequel featuring the same characters, and the Kawami games are remakes of the first two entries. I didn't know that, Chris. I didn't. I certainly didn't know that either. So that's cool, though. It's good to know. I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I got such a key fundamental part of that particular story wrong, but... I don't care about Yakuza. So I guess that goes to show you how little I know and understand about the series. And I'm sorry about that. Yeah, n- we usually <laughs> neither of us are particularly experts on Yakuza at all. No, no. We usually don't do corrections on Sacred Symbol for Sacred Symbols Plus on this show. Uh, but that was such an egregious error that I wanted to make sure yeah. that, that that was remedied. So I'm sorry about that. Also, AJ wrote into us and said, hey, Colin, you said on Xbox Sacred Symbols Plus that Sony would never end a press event with a multi-platform game. They ended E3 2013 with the reveal of Destiny. Well, you know what, AJ? Fuck you. All right. <laughs> I did the very best that I could. It's been I was a while. almost right. It's been a while in, in fairness. 
I've, it's I've, been it's several been, years since they've done that. Now, Chris, let me tell you something. This is a total non sequitur, but right. I can't find I, I'm out of my smart water water bottle. So I have to go to the store and buy some after I'm done with you today. But I have these, you know, these you know, you've been here many times. This crystal geyser water bottles that are gallon mm-hmm. you know, yeah. gallon or whatever. And I'm just drinking straight out of it. And it's so inconvenient. It's just such a huge <laughs> it's such a huge bottle of water. I have a big uh, Arizona iced tea thing next to me, like a container that I'm working with. I'd rather be drinking that than whatever is going on here with this thing. But nonetheless, Azan wrote into us and uh, said, good morning, Colin and Chris. Hope this post finds you both well. Since the inception of Sacred Symbols, how does Chris prepare for the podcast each week? Does he read video game news articles and analysis or he reacts to news on the spot during the show? Chris, how do you prepare? I mean, I read through the doc. I check. I I try to keep up with stuff as it goes on. But like, there's some stuff that I'm like, if there's like a trailer that I haven't seen, I don't know if I'm going to go out of my way to watch it. You know what I mean? I'd rather hear what you have to say about it. Sure. And then uh, sort of it's a it's a combination of reacting on the spot and also like light, some light reading, some light reading. I I understand that. Yeah. I mean, I'm like I've said many times on this show, I'm not directly mainlining you know, video game news and uh, every day. And I don't read almost any op-eds or anything like that. I don't watch really any videos. So I just go check in a few times a week and we write the show. And then, yeah, that's how Chris prepares. It's good to know. We appreciate your inquiry. Mm, Yeah. But it's not as exciting as you might think. It's not as glamorous. Very very bland and very boring. (laughs) It's just we prepare. We're ready to go. I like to I like to be overly prepared for the shows because I'm driving it. Yeah. And so I just like to be prepared for that. But that is fair. No, you know, there's there's only a little bit of uh, preparation uh, going in apart from just getting all the news together. A lot of it for me and I think for Chris, too, is just making sure we play some games and yeah. uh, familiarize ourselves with those from that perspective. Uh, so thank you for checking in. Saul Nolasco asked a question. I'm not sure how I feel about it, but I want to run it by you. He says, good day, gents. If meat is so bad, why do vegans and vegetarians try to make their food taste like meat? This is a. Uh, a little bit of a conundrum for me, Chris, because I don't know if this if he's got a good point or not, because now we're in this era now of the impossible burger, which is the soy. I think it's soy based and it's so popular that like they can barely like keep up with the supply of it at yeah. these various restaurants. Uh, you go to a mommy burger, for instance. I like that place, too. They have the impossible burger there. Why make a burger? I guess that's a good question. And my answer to that is because meat tastes really good. Yeah, no, you know? meat's, meat is objectively delicious, even to people who are <laughs> fundamentally opposed to. To the concept of it. I, th- I think I think for them, it's an ethical thing, mm. you know, like, oh, I don't want to eat an animal that has its, you know, face cheese grated off by some sadistic farmer in the middle of Ohio, you know. So it's like, you know, if you can get that taste without the, uh, you know, the egregious sins, you know, then maybe maybe why not? Why not get that taste? I found that the more violently that the animal was killed, the tastier the meat is. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, yeah. It's the, but the taste of a of a uh... <laughs> a violently massacred cow tastes better than a cow that was just. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's I mean, that's my experience. That's my yeah, experience. The, tor- the torment really, it's like uh, it's like seasoning almost. There are some people I know that eat meat that have a problem with certain kinds of meat, though. I know a lot of people that have a problem with veal because it's a baby cow that's like murdered in its adolescence. That's somehow worse than just and like that's a... somehow worse. Yeah. I, I mean, I. It's not going to stop me from eating the veal. Yeah, I feel I feel terrible. I feel terrible about all the meat I eat, but I'm not going to stop. Like, you know, I, I'll shed uh, I'll shed like a, I'll get a little misty eyed maybe. Yeah. Every yeah. once in a I, while. I don't want to see it or know about it. That's my whole thing. Yeah. Someone else takes care of that. You yeah. know, like I actually have. You ever see those videos? They were really popular, actually, in like the late 90s and early 2000s in the pre YouTube era. But the videos of like people breaking into these farms and getting like this really these really like vivid videos of the way the animals live and the way the animals are killed it really is pretty tough like to watch i really have a problem with that especially with i mean it's really awful with any animal but apparently it's the worst with pigs because pigs are actually apparently really intelligent Um, so you're kind of like torturing it or like not torturing but kind of stifling the life of like a dog basically um which is by the way dogs are eaten in parts of the world i'm not necessarily Casting aspersions on that, I can't possibly imagine that, but I'm not trying to you know, be a relativist. Yeah, or whatever. yeah. yeah the, the, uh, as long as the, I, I'd like to think that we're getting better about treating the animals better, about giving them a better life, as it yeah. were. It's tough because meat is so cheap in the United States. I don't know if people are willing to 
sacrifice three dollar pounds of ground beef for cows that live these really fulfilling lives in which case your burgers are gonna cost 25 bucks it's a, it's a tough thing yeah for sure to a uh, balance uh, in 1900 in the united states uh average american family was spending one third of their income on food can you imagine that it's unbelievable that's <laughs> that's wild so food has gotten so much cheaper. And by the way, my violent talk about the animals was obviously a joke. So yeah, everyone relax. I, but everyone I don't know, man. I feel like to live completely ethically, you just need to live in the mountains. Like by yourself. Right. And make your own clothes because, you, I don't know, you, there's like probably a thing in your phone that was made by some Taiwanese child with like eight fingers. You know, oh, like you can't control definitely. that. Like, what are you going to do? You're just going to not use anything. It's incredibly difficult. It's exactly what we were taught. It's so funny because I just brought this up for no reason at all, but it actually ties in directly with our conversation about Blizzard and China and all that. We were in Tencent yeah, and yeah. NetEase. It's like everything comes at a cost and your iPhones being made at uh, Foxconn in China comes at a cost, which is not very high for Apple, but certainly yeah. high for the people that are uh, making them. So, yeah, good, good thought. And our PlayStations, too, by the way, yeah. and all the other stuff. Now, Chris, I hate to revisit the story, but I also love to revisit the story. A couple weeks ago. Austin Kohler wrote into us oh my God. about how he shit his pants on a date. And then we had a follow up from another listener unrelated uh, to Austin that was asking about the uh, the semantics of him shitting his pants. And Austin actually wrote in with an incredible amount of detail of what happened on his date. Good. And great. I feel like we have to get through this, especially because the ending might surprise you. The ending right. might surprise you. Austin Kohler wrote in and said, hey, fellas, it's me, the guy who pooped his pants. To those of you interested in hearing the details of the poop story, here they are. He says he's 27 years old, he's 5'11", and he's 155 pounds. So first of all, you are a tall glass of water. <laughs> I am six feet tall and I'm 180 pounds. So you're in much better shape than me. He says his location was a local bar, bathroom type, single person. And then the chart was the consistency of yogurt. Quantity, about two thirds of a Snickers bar. Okay, so we have all of the detail we need here. He follows up by saying... The cleanup going commando was an option at first because this is what we were talking about last week. Right. Did he go commando? Did he take his underwear off? What happened? He God says going commando was an option at first, but that quickly changed. The waddling over to the sink and taking off of the pants mixed with the consistency of the fecal matter caused the goo to soak to my boxer briefs getting onto my pants. Once the poop made contact with the pants, I knew it was over. It wasn't going to try. I wasn't going to try and continue the date. I threw my underwear away, tried to t try to dry and clean the remaining poop in my pants as best I could, then headed out to tell my date. Telling the girl I was in the bathroom for no less than 15 minutes, so I knew she knew something was up. I walked straight over to her and said verbatim, I shit my pants. She replied after a couple of seconds with, really? To which I said, yeah, you seem awesome and all, but I got to bounce. The ride home. My Uber driver had a plastic grocery bag I sat on. We had some good laughs at first, but then it quickly turned awkward when he felt the only thing we had in common was poop and kept wanting to trade poop stories. Now, here's where it gets interesting, Chris. In my original post postscript, I said that there wasn't a second date. Funny enough, soon after writing in, she hit me up and we've gone out and hooked up a couple of times. True love. That remains to be seen. Anyway, I hope this clears up any questions. Love the pod. Keep up the great work. Pretty <laughs> I hate, I, wild story he brought us on. Yeah, there, is it no, not? I despise it. <laughs> I despise every bit of this. Really? You don't like I See, I no, think it's man. really an uplifting story. No, it's, it's, uh, it's what I don't like about it. Oh, I don't like okay. anything that doesn't reinforce my pessimistic worldview. I oh well, that makes a lot of sense then. Never mind. We hope we wish that it worked out a lot worse for you than it did. <laughs> now, see, it couldn't have. See, it couldn't have actually. Here's the thing about this: it couldn't have worked out any better. Yeah, literally. That's, that's the ironic thing. It couldn't have worked out literally any better. The girl knew he shit his pants and he left the first date, and then she called him. That's insane. That makes no sense. Like, I definitely would have lied. I would have George Costanza'd my way out of that situation. I think I'm, I'm, a, I'm pretty good at that. I could do it. This book's been flagged. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a specific episode. But uh, I don't know. I, I had a, I, I don't you know, I don't want to talk about poop every week, but that's quite the story. Yeah, at least it's at least it has an ending. Three acts. Yeah, it has an ending and it has an ending again. That doesn't quite it's not quite parallel with Chris's pessimistic worldview, but it's a it's an optimistic uh, story for our audience, nonetheless. And finally, Chris, before we get into what we're playing, James wrote in and said, Afternoon to my favorite CNC duo. With all the talk about the cross-gen games and ports, I wanted to bring up a few things from the PS3 era to PS4. Many games allowed for people to do a 999 upgrade from the PS3 version to PS4, some big ones being Assassin's Creed Black Flag and Call of Duty Ghosts. 
This could easily be implemented again for PS4 versions, the prettier PS5 models. Also, some games like Shadow of, the, of Mortar had the Nemesis system on the PS4, but removed that mechanic from the PS3. So some games could have some kind of gameplay mechanic that encourages moving on to the new generation. I hope this adds some options to discuss as we move forward to the next big thing. Love the podcast and happy to support you both. Keep making Tuesdays and Fridays my favorite podcast days. Chris, I wanted to bring this up because we talked about this last week about how you might transition from one generation to the other. Yeah. And I looked this up because I was like, really? I don't remember that. That's true. I, I I did not remember this happening. There was an upgrade system on PlayStation Network where you could upgrade from one um, version of the game to the other. Like downloaded versions? Like Apparently so, yeah. Uh, so if you downloaded <sighs> Black Flag on PS3 and then you wanted it on PS4, you could apparently download it as long as the game was tied to your PSN by, by paying a $9.99 upgrade fee. I didn't know that. Or at least I don't remember that. Yeah, I guess I guess that's an option, but it I just don't. But but they're backwards compatible, right? This is what I'm taught. This is the like the weird part of it. It's like you're we're gonna t- this is going to happen every week. I feel like we're gonna yeah, have somebody talk about this. I've said so much on this topic already, but like I just don't understand the reason why you would do that at all. I don't know. Whatever. I, I, I I'm just angry at this point. It was a bigger surprise to me because I didn't know I didn't think Sony would even be capable of that technical feat. <laughs> that was what was so surprising about it to me. When I read him write that write that into me, I'm like, there's no way that Sony was able to do that. But they 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 somehow figured it out. Because anything that is interesting or useful on PSN, I'm all automatically skeptical about it. <laughs> I'm like, that can't possibly be so. This is a PlayStation network. We have to literally go to internet settings and reset every five minutes so that it actually works. But uh nonetheless, they did manage to do that. Now, Chris. It's time to get into what we're playing. We both yeah. still played Death Stranding. I saw you beat it. We're going to do our spoiler cast in a couple of weeks, so I don't want to get too deep into it, but I'm curious uh, what you thought about the rest of the game. I I really liked it. I had a good time with it. I think it's probably definitely up there for me as far as like uh, generational games. It really sticks out to me as just something that's super unique and super cool. The ending is really Metal Gear Solid 4 which I didn't care for, but at least this time I actually like liked the people involved. Like the cutscene, I liked the characters and all that. All the characters that you meet later on in the late game are like really cool and fascinating and arcs are uh arcs get satisfyingly completed. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of room for a sequel, although there could be. I <laughs> it's got like a I swear to you like the last like 2 hours of the game has like 20 minutes of gameplay. It, it's like that again. So it's like how it starts. Yeah. <laughs> basically yeah there's like a big chunk of gameplay in the middle uh and then at the end it's like it goes into this crazy crazy shit but it's really cool uh it's super artful in its presentation it's super way more coherent than i thought it would be and yeah i i really i really liked it i'm on chapter five right now so i'm not very deep in the game i've been a little busy with moving all my stuff and getting ready for the holidays and all of this but I must say, I'm still really enjoying it. I still think it's really good, but there's something... I don't even want to say what it is or talk about it outside of the spoiler cast because it is a spoiler. Something very specific happened in the game to me. It happens to everyone. That really made me like it a lot less. And we'll talk about that more in the spoiler cast. I really don't want to get any further into it because I think it's it it's definitely a spoiler. But something very specific occurs where I'm like, ah... You know, like yeah, yeah. I had I had a similar I had a similar moment towards the end. There's something that happens at the end twice that uh, actually audibly had me cursing. I was like, "You got to be fucking kidding me!" I got to. Oh my God, are you joking? You're really making me want to play through the end of the game. I will though. I'm gonna it play is through. Super I'm, good. I'm it's like a it. great. It is a great experience. But like, the, I don't know. This happens with every game. I feel like where I just get to a point where it's like, "Are you seriously doing this?" Like it never it never not happens. I guess my core thing is. Death Stranding turns into a video game at par- at times, which yeah, I know I know exactly what you're talking about. I think which is a problem for me in this specific game. But yeah, we'll we'll leave it we'll leave it there for now. Um, yeah. there are a few inquiries though that we got from the audience before we move on to the other games you've been playing because there's more that you've been playing since that uh, other than Death Stranding, Archimedes Cantero the second. That's some fucking name. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I'll tell you right now, that's some name. 
He wrote in and said, hello, wonderful gentlemen of gaming. I've been playing Death Stranding and loving it. The lore is interesting and I enjoy the info shared in the emails and the interviews that Sam receives, which makes me want to bounce an idea with you guys. In a lot of games with deep world building, there's this bunch of text that I find tedious and tiresome to read on the TV. So I would love it if along with the game, there was an app that could track my progress in the game and allow me to read what I have unlocked when I'm away from the game. One step further, what if a very PlayStation phone app had this feature to allow devs to just put that thing in there and allow me to access the world of the game even when I'm not in the console? I'm an avid book reader, but not when playing games. What do you guys think? Do you find book reading like in Skyrim and immersion as immersion breaking as I do? Keep up the wonderful job and long live sacred symbols. I love this idea. It's a great idea. Yeah, this is really cool. I think Destiny, actually, the original Destiny had a companion app where you could read some of the lore that you got on your phone, and it was actually kind of cool. Uh yeah, this is a great idea. I like it. I don't know if I find it immersion breaking though, if it's in a game though. Like I, I don't I don't mind it either way. But it would be cool to have that on a phone. Yeah, I would love that. I mean, it, it, I will say because the game gives does give you such a large number of uh, in-game emails and and these interviews he's talking about that are kind of lore driven and and really flesh out the world for you that I personally save them up for like every few hours and then I just sit there in my room in the game and just read the console uh, yeah. in the game. And yeah, so I, I don't know if it's immersion breaking. It's just I, I hear what he's saying. It's kind of unfortunate that you have to stop playing in order to like read this real. First of all, really small text. Yeah, no, for sure. On the sc- I don't know what's going on with the small text in games, man. Like the Outer Worlds does this and other games where I'm like, I can't fucking read this game. It's I can't very, see it. <laughs> it's a very PC centric design because on PC, like a lot of text is small because you're so close up. So I think like the small text would work fine if God of War was a PC game, but if it's if your game's literally a console exclusive, like come on, you got got it. It's got to be fixed. Like the Outer Worlds was really driving me nuts. In it's got to at least regard. be. It's got to at least be customizable. Right. Exactly. I don't understand. Well, I guess I understand why it's not customizable because that requires a whole lot more work and making sure everything fits and works and all that. But I don't know. I I, I find that a little frustrating. So yeah, when I'm squinting as best I can reading Death Stranding from a TV that's literally seven feet away from my face, that's probably. Uh, not a good sign, but I can uh, Archimedes. I love this idea and I think it's really cool. And you know what, Chris, it's it's funny because there a game that comes to mind on PS4 that actually did this really well was Killzone Shadowfall, which actually allowed the audio diaries and all that stuff that you found to be read as you're playing through the microphone on the controller, which I thought was kind of cool. It's obviously an early gen thing to show off that you can even do that. Yeah, but but the other uh Similar thing is I still think Bioshock does Intel the best because of the audio diaries that play as you're playing the game. So you're skulking around, you find one, you can listen to it while you're still playing. That's perfect. Yeah. And that's what I loved. I, I Well, it's not what I loved about Bioshock, but that's one of the features of Bioshock storytelling that I think is so powerful is the uh, audio diary thing. Although I know a lot of people don't really care for that because they think it's like, why are people just talking into these? Yeah, it is kind of then- it is. It is definitely like a stylistic choice. Like no, no human person would do, would do that. <laughs> But like, you know, I, I I think you're right. I think it does like that particular aspect of Bioshock is one of the most compelling parts of it. Ben Williams wrote into us, too, on Patreon. Chris, he says, hello, Cumbling Boys. Do you ever find yourself rooting against a game? I have to be honest and say that I've been rooting against the success of Death Stranding. I don't like Kojima games generally, and I don't want to encourage his nonsensical storytelling. See all of the Metal Gear Solid games. And the entire run up to the release of Death Stranding has annoyed me, especially his comments about American gamers. I know I shouldn't feel this way, but I honestly do. Have you ever felt like this towards a game, a publisher or a developer? I don't I don't think so. I don't know. I can't speak for Chris, but I've definitely rooted for outcomes based on things that I predicted because I wanted to be right. That's (laughs) that's happened. Yeah, but. I don't know that I actively give a shit. See, that's what I'm a little confused about with Ben's comment here, Chris, because he's like, I don't like Kojima games generally. Like, so he doesn't like Kojima games. But who, who cares if you don't like Kojima games? Like, I actually don't care for many. I actually don't care for more than half of the Metal Gear Solid games. And yeah, I don't. That's but that's me. So there's still a place for them and there's still a place for Kojima. So, Ben, I'm a little confused about. I understand you being annoyed by Death Stranding's rollout and all that stuff. I was annoyed by that, too. I thought it was like a little you know, smelling your own farts like every day for three years. But. I don't know that I actively have rooted against anything to fail. I don't know that I really care. How about you? I don't think I've ever done that either. I, th- I, I, I remember being annoyed with Call of Duty for a very long time just because I, I felt like I really sincerely feel like it's the worst gameplay loop of any FPS that that exists. But for some reason, people keep coming back to it. I think it's because it does everything it does kind of OK. Hmm. You know what I mean? It's like a yeah. it's like this kind of, hey, you know. Camp, the, what'd you think of the campaign? It was fine. What's the multiplayer? Oh, it's fine. What's zombies? It's fine. 
You know, and, and the fact that it's like a, an all-around, well-rounded, fine product means that people go to it, even though I think there are far better FPS experiences uh, to be found elsewhere. I I remember being annoyed with that for a long time, but I don't think I ever rooted for the failure of a Call of Duty. Right. I don't see how it really matters. I mean, that's, yeah. that's my whole thing is like, sometimes people tweet at me or message me and we're, we're like, oh, Switch is doing a lot better than you thought. I, you know, how does that feel? Whatever. And I'm like, I think that's great. Like. I was wrong about how well the switch would do. And I, that doesn't hurt me. Uh, it's very similar to what I say about Sony. Like, I don't own Sony stock, so I don't really care how PlayStation does. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. I don't like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really matter to me. I, I, I like PlayStation and I like the console and I like the ecosystem and I like the players and the games and all that. But like how it does is only relevant to me in as much as like we get more games. Um, yeah. And so my argument would be like, I understand, Ben, you don't like Kojima games. You don't like Death Stranding. You don't like Metal Gear. That's fine. Um, but you should always root for more games, I think, uh, of a triple A quality and people trying out new things. It's really the lower end uh, where we're having all the problems. Yeah. So now, Chris, uh, in our planning document, it also says that you played Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and After Party. So I want to ask you about both of them. Let's take After Party first. Actually, how are you enjoying that game? Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, if you don't know uh, if or if the audience isn't familiar with it, it's a, it's a night school game. I think that's the studio. They It's like kind of like a narrative side scroller story based you know choice driven game about two two uh, teenagers or college students who die and have to beat the devil in a drinking contest to to get out of hell and uh, go back to earth and it's it's super fun it's a narrative game it's like all about the narrative and the characters interacting and i think it's like super good in that respect all the characters are super cool uh, it's really well acted and really well written i like it i like it a lot Super simple. It's definitely like a niche game. I would recommend like looking some looking at some trailers or maybe like a, a little bit of gameplay before you even consider checking it out. But uh, I, I think it's cool. It looks neat. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm excited that you played it because it's a game that's like on my list that I don't know that I'll ever actually have the time to play. That, that Those night school guys, they made Oxen Free, right? Isn't that yeah. the, the last game they made? Yeah, which I also didn't play, which I heard was great. So it's no surprise, I guess, that their follow up is also a good game. And uh, I'm eager to hear what you think about Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, because I'm really having a hard time not playing it because I'm really trying to be disciplined in. I, I'm like, I got to get through Death Stranding. I got to get through the Outer Worlds so I can just not be distracted by these games. But Fallen Order is getting great reviews and it looks really cool. And it actually sounds like a manageable game in terms of length, too. So what do you think about that? It's also particularly good. It's I feel like it's been a good month. Generally speaking, like we've had a good stretch of pretty solid games. I don't think anything's come out that's been terrible. But this is a it's a good it's a good one. It's it's uncharted like exploration with kind of Sekiro style combat. It's not nearly as punishing as Sekiro, but there is like an emphasis on parrying and uh it it's 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 cool that sword combat actually feels you know like sword combat. Like it, it it's not like uh, Force Unleashed where you could just mow down a bunch of people like anything more than two people. If you're taking on more than two enemies at a time, it's actually it's actually kind of tough, and it's 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 pretty cool. I I don't really care for Star Wars that much. I've never really been that into the lore or anything. I think uh, I think the lore is kind of silly. There's a lot mm. of names that sound like like Muppet shit. Yeah, there are a lot of Muppet names in there. No <laughs> yeah, doubt. like one of the first planets. Uh, one of the <laughs> some guys dramatically telling you about uh, an alien race called the Zepho, <laughs> and I'm like, this come on. <laughs> it sounds, it's like shut up. It sounds so <laughs> stupid. But the story is good. I like I like the character so far. Like Deborah Wilson is in it. He was like this act actress, like as famous. I was like, what the hell? So the cast is cool. You know, the gameplay is really solid. I like it a lot more than I thought I would. But it really is this kind of hybrid, Soulsborne, Uncharted like narrative single player Star Wars game, and it's actually really good. And it's the first time we've had a a good single player Star Wars game in a very 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 long time. Yeah, I was gonna say I think. I'm not even sure we've had a triple A single single player Star Wars game since Force Awakened 2, right? Force I mean, Unleashed, is that the, yeah. Force on, I'm sorry, Force Unleashed 2. Force Awakened is the uh, the movie. That's the last one, right? I, I can't even think of another uh, yeah, I think single so. player Star Wars game since then. And that, that I mean that was that was the LucasArts era. That was not that was pre-Disney, so that's a long time ago. So yeah, pretty interesting stuff. And I'm really fascinated to talk to you more about it when we do our spoiler cast and review discussion because you're coming at it more from a uh, a respawn fan. Yeah, I'm coming yeah. at it more from. I'm a lap Star Wars fan, but I used to be a massive Star Wars nerd. So, 
Um, I'm interested to see it, and I, I'm excited to see if EA can thread this needle and keep this going with this with these fine single player games. Keeping in mind, uh, they've only produced three Star Wars games since they've gotten the license, and yeah. so it's not there's not a great amount of games. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm interested most to see what happens to respawn because they're going to be perfectly fine, of course. But they have two hits now that they have to straddle when they actually seem most eager to get back to the third game which is painful. Yeah. No, definitely. It shocks the hell out of me that they were able to make something like this. Like, this is actually really shocking to see, like, a developer that's known for just first-person shooters and really solid ones take this kind of... I don't know. This is, like, a wild shift. And the fact that it's so good, I think, is the most shocking part. Like, I expected it to be, like, kind of off just because it's such a massive departure from what they're used to. But it's actually super good. It's actually kind of better than a lot of third-person games that I recall playing from a lot of people who or from a lot of developers who kind of specialize in it. So it's it's wild. I'm excited about it, man, because it seems I'm always going to have this instinct that this game was made quickly and was kind of like a last ditch effort to please Disney after great sales, of course, of Battlefront and Battlefront 2, but not good critical reception. So hopefully they get a little bit of both. And I can imagine a future where Respawn is really going with three teams because yeah. you would imagine they want to keep Apex Legends going that gives them every reason to return to Titanfall with Titanfall 3, which I know that they wanted to do even before Star Wars Fallen Order was announced. And then if this Fallen Order game sells well enough and is appreciable enough for uh, the Andrew Wilsons and all those guys at EA, then we'll probably get another one of those, too. So we'll see how this all shakes out. I'm excited about it. Austin DeBose wrote into us, said, how's it hanging, CNC? First time right in and patron. Well worth it, by the way. Thank you so much, Austin. Just wanted to ask you guys, with Jedi Fallen Order out now and the rest of the year mostly being a dead zone, thank God. What games in your backlog do you plan on catching up on? Chris, I'm actually most excited that the games are pretty much out now. Yeah. With with rare exception, I think the only game that I really want to play that's not out yet this year is King of Cards, which we're going to talk about in a little while, which is the Shovel Knight DLC. Otherwise, it's it's a nice time to catch up. So what do you, how are you planning on spending the next, uh, let's say, six weeks or so as we, we lead up to our Game of the Year discussion? No, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm d definitely going to try and finish Fallen Order. I, I feel like it's a manageable game. Uh, and then I want to go back... Uh, into the Outer Worlds and take a little bit of time with it. But I don't know, man. I feel like I've somehow managed to get through a lot of my backlog kind of accidentally. I know I haven't finished Sekiro, so I really want to do that, and I might have a have a have an itch from Fallen Order to do that, but I would like to I would like to actually finish Sekiro. That's gonna be a tough one to go back to, don't you think? Do you think you're gonna have to start it again? Probably, but I wasn't super far into it. Right. Like I, I feel like I feel like as soon as I started back up again, like from the beginning, I'll be like, OK, I'll get back into the groove and I'll remember shit because it's like it's a Soulsborne. So like it's it's a lot of map memorization. You're going through the same maps over and over again. So I feel like as soon as I get back into that system, I'll remember like, oh, this is where that path was. And like, I, I think I could manage it. See, I'm getting a little afraid even with the Outer Worlds because I played the Outer Worlds when it came out for about a week and then Death Stranding came out. So I went to that. And I'm getting afraid that I'm getting too distant now from the Outer Worlds where I'm not going to remember how to play it or what I'm doing and stuff like that. And I actually am pretty far in it. So right. I think what I actually have to do, unfortunately, see, in a perfect world, I think if I wasn't in the gaming industry, what I would have done is not even played Death Stranding yet and just finished the Outer Worlds and then went to Death Stranding and then went to Fallen Order and so on and so forth and Call of Duty. Yeah. But I think what I'm going to have to do, Chris, is probably jump back to the Outer Worlds pretty soon in the next day or two and play it for a day or so just to kind of restart the clock in my mind, whether or not that's an accurate thing or not, but at least how I play and my familiarity with it, then go back to Death Stranding because I realized that I've been playing Death Stranding. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to play any game, really, but I've really been dicking around in Death Stranding like a lot. <laughs> really? Yeah, like just delivering random things I find and like, you know, like re like picking up every package I see and doing a lot of these uh, normal orders and stuff like that. Oh, my God. Then, no, I haven't been doing that. And then realized, you know, I, I this is just like not doing anything. I'm not doing anything other than like slowly getting likes and stuff. But that's the way the game kind of suggested it wanted me to play it. Uh, now that I have an idea that I should probably be moving a little quicker, maybe I can get through Death Stranding quicker, but I don't want to I don't want to rush through it. I am looking forward, though, to this dead zone because I don't know, man, I, I, I personally do need some time to catch up with these games. I think I play games way slower than you. I don't think I'm as good as, at games as you are, generally speaking. And I think that I just play these things slower, too. So. Mm -hmm. It makes a little sense that I'd be a little bit farther behind you, but uh, I did hear with Fallen Order that you should play it on hard because it's not very hard if you don't. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's it's not super hard if you don't play it on the hardest difficulty. But at the same time, it's like I look at a Star Wars game and I think, oh, I just want to 
kind of play a Star Wars game. I don't necessarily want Bloodborne. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like I'm playing it on I think the second to hardest difficulty and I'm I think it's challenging. It's totally it's it's fine to me. It's like the right amount of challenging because at the end of the day I just want to feel like a cool guy with a lightsaber. I want some challenge in there obviously, but like I I, I don't want to be fighting the same stormtrooper 50 times and then like just lose all my shit constantly. Like, to- not, I totally, yeah, I totally. It's just not that. fun. No, I understand that. Yeah, God, I love that we're having a lot of conversations about fun lately because it's so. <laughs> I don't know why, but like it's it's often ignored with games these days. Like, what's fun? And yeah, and it's obviously a really relevant part of video games. So, the wintry months are upon us, which is always an essential time for a man's beard. Will you shave yours off and allow your face to brave the harshest of elements? Will you grow something thick and luscious like the facial hair of a Cossack on the Russian taiga? Or perhaps you'll split the difference, keeping your beard and or mustache, but trimming it down to size. Well, whatever you decide to do with that man mane of yours, our friends at Dollar Shave Club have you covered. Now, don't let the name fool you. Dollar Shave Club actually has a whole lot more than just shaving gear, but their ultimate shave starter set is a great way to initiate yourself to what they're all about. Within, you get the aptly named Executive Razor, since you're such a boss and all. And you'll also get a trifecta of creams and ointments to assist in your shave. Shave butter, prep scrub, and post-shave dew. Indeed, your face is bound to be a glorious slip and slide of smoothness once Dollar Shave Club is finished with you. Or perhaps you're just cleaning up your neck or around your beard or wherever else. Whatever the case might be, the Ultimate Shave Starter Set will get you going on a newfound path of svelte beardery with a side of sexiness. To try the starter set for yourself, go to dollarshaveclub.com slash symbols, where you only have to pay $5 for the honor of having it sent to your home. And trust me, it's a great honor indeed. Again, to try Dollar Shave Club's Ultimate Shave Starter Set for only 5 bucks, head to dollarshaveclub.com slash symbols. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S. And tell them Large Marge sent you. Actually, don't tell them that or they'll think you're a psycho. All right, let's move on to the news, Chris. There's quite a bit to get through, including a couple of really big pieces of news. So we'll start uh, with number one. If a new Sony file patent is any indication, PlayStation 5's DualShock 5 is set to look a whole lot like PlayStation 4's DualShock 4. Website Video Game Chronicle points towards a Japanese patent for the controller and side-by-side images of the patents for DualShock 4 and what appears to be DualShock 5 show differences, but slight ones. DualShock 5 seems to be slightly chunkier from the side, with less of a pronounced divot leading up to the triggers. The shape of the shoulder button seems similar, though the new pattern seems to show a slightly smaller L1 and R1, and a slightly larger L2 and R2. There's a charging port on the top of the controller, though interestingly, it's in the middle of the controller. The light bar seems to be gone completely. The face buttons are are obviously the same, the D-pad is the same, the sticks are parallel instead of offset, which is expected, and interestingly, the touchpad seems to remain though it doesn't wrap around the top of the controller, like on DualShock 4. An onboard speaker remains below the pad, and below that is the PlayStation button, wedged in between the sticks. It looks like the options and share buttons will return too. The bottom of the controller appears to have a new ports, however, and it's unclear what they are, though it's unlikely to do, it's likely to, rather, all to do with the headsets and microphones uh, once again. Chris, did you see these patents? Uh, I did not see these patents, no. So these just, right before we started recording this morning, started circulating. Um, and they emerged out of Japan. And the schematics are interesting because it shows, I think, the biggest parallel jump in controllers since PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, which obviously wasn't supposed to happen. We talked about that a week or two ago, I think, uh, where the Boomerang controller was obviously supposed to be the PS3 controller, and they abandoned that at the last minute and used the mold from the PS2 controller to make the PS3 controller, which is why (laughs) they look exactly the same. This controller looks just like DualShock 4 with just slightly with slight differences. It's chunkier. It's supposed to be heavier, which makes sense. There's haptic feedback in it now. Um, the battery life is longer, all of that. So that's not a huge surprise. But I'm quite pleased by what I saw of the DualShock 5. And we don't have any confirmation from Sony about what this is or whatever, but we it, it is what it is. How do you feel about uh, the lack of uh, light bar? I'm pleasantly surprised by this. This is what we talked about with the my fear about DualShock 4 to DualShock 5 was I was concerned that Sony and maybe rightfully so, in making backwards compatibility as accessible as possible would make DualShock 5 work with DualShock or with PlayStation 4 games, but it doesn't seem like that's necessarily going to be the case because I don't know, like the light is used with the camera, the light is used with 6-axis, and then the light is used with PSVR. 
So I'm really a little bit interested and confused about how this is all going to work now with backwards compatibility. It seems like you're going to have to have a DualShock 4 to play your PS4 games. And I actually think that's a mistake. I don't I don't like that. So if keeping the light bar in there was a necessity in order to make it more fully backwards compatible, I actually would have supported it. But I know that the, the light bar was immediately a problem with a lot of people. And you might remember, Chris, that Sony realized that, that you couldn't they couldn't with software make the light bar shut off at all. So the only thing they can do is make it dimmer. Is that why you can you you can't shut it off? They haven't figured out how to shut the the fucking light off. Yeah, apparently the light needs to be on, and there's no way to shut it off. Like there was no. So let's go back to 2013, 2014, in the early firmware updates for PS4. One of the first things they did was make it so that you can dim that light on the front. And what they said at the time was that that was the best they could really do, was force the PS4 to make the light dimmer but not shut it off entirely. So people will know you can still go into the options and, and do that to this day and make yeah. the light light. Uh, I noticed that immediately because I remember when I first got my PS4, I was like, how do I shut this light off? Yeah, it's it's so it's really distracting. Like when you're playing in a dark room, it reflects off the screen. It reflects off of glass. Like if you're near a window. Yeah, it, I understand. the It also drains of, battery. Yeah, it also drains battery. But you could tell, Chris, that this was something that was made and tested in like a conference room. No, yeah, like it, it wasn't someone didn't go home with this thing and be like, oh, yeah, uh, the massive blue light on the front of the controller is reflecting off of the TV screen. You know, like, like, I don't know how you didn't they didn't realize these things at first, but it was a necessity for what we didn't realize at the time was going to be a PSVR functionality. So I am excited about the continuity in the controllers, but I am a little bit confused. And I guess what I would say is I'm more confused that they're keeping the touchpad than I am that they're getting rid of the light bar. The touchpad sucks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And you think that you would keep that in order to have continuity between generations, but without the light bar, that's clearly not the case. So this adds, this inserts a little bit of confusion, but uh, Sony hasn't said anything official about it yet. If you read some murmurings about devs that have DualShock 5 uh, for their dev kits, they basically say it's just a DualShock 4 controller. So I guess not a huge surprise there. I want the share button gone. I don't like the share button at all. I don't like it either because I hit it on accident. <laughs> it took me a long time. It took me a really long time to not hit it by accident. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, what's funny, too, is that I, I guess I just turned off the ability. Like, I, I basically in my mind turned off that button from the very get go. Like, I never use it. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I want to share this video of this thing online. <laughs> how do I do that? You know, like, how are people sharing their Twitter things? And then I looked online and I'm like, oh, yeah. There's a share button on the controller. <laughs> God, dude, I have some fucking moments in my yeah. life where I'm like, what is going on in my mind? Yeah. Uh, and that was one of those moments. But it's funny, too, because when I went and played PS3 recently to play The Last of Us, which I played on PS3 instead of the PS4 version, I replayed it. I kept going to hit the touchpad on the PS3 controller. So there is like m m but our, m uh, muscle memory like there for me to just going hitting in that thing. But since everyone uses it as a button, I can't even remember the last game that uses it as a touchpad. I think the last game I remember using it as a touchpad was like Second Son. Yeah. You think that they would have gotten rid of that? I, I don't understand the point of that thing. I would even have put like four more buttons there or something like that. I, I think hopefully, I mean, that was the idea initially, right? Like that each corner of the touchpad could be like a, an additional button. Yeah, that was the way, but it doesn't really work. No. You know? So maybe it works this time. <laughs> yeah, maybe it could have something to do with one of the things you noticed in the which I, I said in the lot in the uh, write up was one of the things you definitely notice when you put the controller schematic side by side is that the deep or the uh, touchpad doesn't wrap around the top of the controller on DualShock 5, which might make it more of a sturdy button. Yeah, which is nice because that that curve up to the top is weird. I never really understood what that was supposed to do either or why that was there. So I, I kind of like the curve, honestly. There's got to be some sort of mechanical reason for it. I just I, I just aesthetically I it looks good. But like, yeah, functionality is it's completely out the window. Well, no one's going to be able to see it aesthetically because you're blinding them with that bright blue fucking light in the front of the controller anyway. That's so, fair. It's like you're being abducted by aliens when you sh when you point that at someone. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, more to keep an eye out. We'll see if Sony. I doubt we're going to hear anything official about the DualShock 5 for a long time. Um, yeah, but we'll obviously keep an eye out for that. Here's an interesting one, too, Chris. This was originally the top story before. The DualShock 5 news number two, a report from website Kotaku indicates that EA owned developer BioWare intends on rescuing its in peril loop based shooter Anthem rather than abandon it to a slow but certain death. 
called both Anthem 2.0 and Anthem Next inside the studio. Journalist Jason Schreier writes that Electronic Arts, the true stakeholder here as publisher, doesn't even know what form this rehaul will take. He writes in part, quote, they're still figuring out whether updates should be released at all at once or even an extended period of time. Anthem could be overhauled through a series of updates, a la No Man's Sky. It could get, ga- it could get game-changing expansions like Destiny's critically acclaimed Taken King. Most of Anthem's biggest systems, its mission structure, its loot, its world will change drastically, but the developers have not yet figured out exactly what that will look like. They're even considering releasing Anthem Next as a brand new game, although those who work on the project said that this could take lots of forms and it's unlikely they'll charge full price price to Anthem players, end quote. Anthem came out in February of 2019 on PS4 and elsewhere and never took off like some of its better known, better performing and better respected contemporaries. Braden Summers wrote into us and said, hey, gents, there seems to be rumors going around that Anthem is getting a complete overhaul. If true, how do you theorize Bioware go about this? Exactly what and how would they need to do to revitalize this game? It has been done before, of course. So what can be learned? Chris, how do you feel about this? This is a Pretty interesting story and actually one that I'm pretty stoked about. It's, it, it shows that EA is a little more alive than I thought in terms of what people think. Yeah, it's it's definitely nice to see. I don't know. I'm always a big fan whenever a game launches in a poor state and developers stick by it and make it into something cool. I'm st- <laughs> I'm infinitely skeptical that they can even do this just because of the kind of game it is. Like It works for No Man's Sky because No Man's Sky is such a weird game that doesn't really exist in a genre that's particularly you know crowded um i feel like it worked for warframe back in the day because it was a similar situation this i i I don't know man i i i feel like part of me is like you really should go to dragon age like you really should go to dragon age but like i mean at the same time i'm also like I'm, i'm of two minds about it like i also like it when developers stick by the shit so i don't really know how to feel about this I'm of multiple minds about this as well, Chris, because the consumer in me is like, this is great because people that bought Anthem are going to be tended to and people that paid $60, particularly for Anthem, I don't think got a $60 game. And I think everyone realizes and knows that. I think EA could have played this multiple ways. And I think you could play devil's advocate and, and they could have been like, listen, we have a few really massive games as a service that we push out content for it and we support like Apex Legends and Battlefront 2 and, and Battlefield 5 and all of these games are going and and we're supporting them and they could come out and say like Anthem just wasn't Anthem just didn't work and, and we're going to move on and we're sorry about that and I think that that's one way you could have played it I don't know that it would have been an optically wise way to play it but it's one way that they could have gotten out of this situation but part of me Chris feels that this is the only way forward for them because EA is such a big name Bioware is such a big developer and Anthem was supposed to be such a big deal in this occupied genre that you're talking about. The Bob Dylan of video games. That's exactly right. (laughs) That that to me, Chris, I look at it and I'm like, well, this might be the easiest solution for them is to just go back and remake it. And they can look, you know, um, we got an inquiry from an audience member asking, like, well, what can they learn? and What can they do? Chris brought up Warframe, which is a great example. No Man's Sky is an interesting example. I don't quite know why Jason Schreier brought that up, because to Chris's point, that's like a, a pseudo multiplayer game. It, it's, yeah. it's a game that just exists by itself. It doesn't really require you to play anyone else. It's cool that they fixed it. I think that's great. But I think that the bigger analogs are what's going on with Fallout 76 and what happened back in the day with Final Fantasy 14. And I think you can learn a great deal from those things. Final Fantasy 14 was horrible when it came out. And... A Realm Reborn was the the game that revived it or the version of the game that revived it. And no one even talks about that anymore. Similar to very how Warframe, no one really talked about Warframe six years ago. But with Fallout 76, you see a, a publisher and a developer desperately trying to save their game. And it's not working. At least it's not working optically. And Anthem is the eighth best selling game in the United States this year. So EA might also be looking and being like, we have a big group of gamers that if we just treated this right, might come back to us. So I I don't know, man. I I don't know what the right answer is here, but I'm pleased um, as a consumer that they're doing this. Right. That's fair. Yeah, I think it's I think there's I mean, there's a lot to lose, actually, a lot (laughs) tens of millions of dollars actually to lose in in remaking this game. And whether it will not it will distract from Dragon Age 4, I I don't think so. I don't think it's going to. But uh, I think that's just a different team uh, with different specializations. But they really dropped the ball with Anthem and they have to fix it. Oh, they don't have to, but I guess they're going to. Yeah, I think I think my biggest issue with just Anthem in general is that it just seems like there wasn't really much of a soul there to salvage. Like with No Man's Sky, you could at least see like the kind of new thing that they were trying. 
and how that could prove difficult, especially for a small studio like Hello Games. And with like, you know, Destiny, like when Destiny launched, it was a similar kind of like, oh, there's not much content, but there, it, it had like some kind of soul to it. It, 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 it. it had a personality to it. Warframe even had like, you know, this really core independent vibe to it that a lot of people flo- like flock to. But like with like, there's nothing about Anthem that even particularly screams Bioware. There's nothing about it that seems compelling narratively. There's nothing about it that seems compelling from a genre standpoint. I don't know, man. I, 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 I'm with you. Like, I feel like it's a good thing that they're doing this. But also, I'm like, this is just, I don't think this is ever going to work. That's the big question is if it's going to work or not. Because what, yeah. what this reminds me of a little bit, Chris, is what 2K and Turtle Rock did with Evolve when they tried to save it at the last second by making it free to play and really supporting it. And that didn't work. So... Like, no one cared, no one went to the game, and Turtle Rock's a fucking big deal in the multiplayer space, and in, in that persistent space, so, um, or at least in that team-based space, so it can go both ways, and I don't know anyone thought that Warframe was going to be able to be saved, and it was, and I think that a lot of people probably think Fallout 76 can be saved, and I don't think it's going to be, so we'll see, we'll see how it all turns out, but uh, much to keep an eye on, and uh, thank you for t- to Kotaku for uh, breaking that story. We give them a lot of shit, so we might as well uh, praise them when it's deserved. Yeah. Number three, Media Molecule's Dreams, the PS4-centric creation software under development for nearly a decade, may just have a release date, though at the time of recording this podcast, Sony has yet to officially announce anything. A tweet sent out by British retailer Shop2 told the world that the game is coming out on February 14th of 2020, giving customers the ability to pre-order it. Cool minimalist box art was also shown off. The box art's actually really cool if anyone wants to go check it out. Website Push Square spotted the tweet and also noted that the tweet has since been deleted with neither comment from Sony or the merchant. Dreams is already kind of sort of out, having entered so-called early access on PS4 back in April of this year for $29.99. With February 14th being a Friday, however, and with a well-known retailer seemingly breaking its embargo, it's safe to assume we're going to see Dreams leave early access and enter its final retail form very soon. Uh, Michael Peckin wrote in and said, hey there, long distance lovers. It seems we may have a release date leak for Dreams of 214. This seems very soon as it feels very recently that they said they were going to get in developers to create levels. Do you think the game is truly finished or as Sony said, fuck it and we have to push it out? Thanks for your time. Please get Chris to do another damn YouTube video. It has been a little while, Chris. It's been a minute, yeah. Since you've done a YouTube I've video. I've been doing Death Stranding this whole time. I know Chris is busy with other more important things than videos. But yeah, uh, this is strange. I really do. First of all, I believe this date. Um, not only is it a Friday, which is a traditional release date, especially for PlayStation exclusives, but... Uh, Shop 2 is a British retailer. I, don't, I just don't know where they would get all this from, if not from Sony itself. Yeah. They, they, if people go look at the tweet, which has been deleted, it's a, it's like a link to a, a like a, a pre-order link. It's an image of the game. It's the game's box art and the release date. I, I just don't think you just spontaneously tweet that out. No. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, I dollars to donuts streams is coming out February 14th, guys. It looks like, <laughs> you know, yeah. so we can squeeze that in there somewhere. I don't, know what this means for the game what do you think do you think this game has any prayer of of success of success yeah Ah. let's say commercial success i think it's going to be critically fine but let's say commercially Mm, no it's 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 so niche if it's it's got a campaign in it does it that's what they said i I don't know if that's actually i don't know man this is a this is an engine it's it's gary's mod you know i don't think it's going to appeal to a lot of people especially on console either I don't think so either. And wedging it in there, they have to get the game out. I mean, to his point, to the question he asked, it's like, is Sony just saying, fuck it? It's I, I assume that they have to at some point say, fuck it. Like, this is this is enough now. Like, <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? So, yeah, Shop 2 wouldn't just tweet out the box art and the release date without any information to go on and, and solicit pre-orders. They deleted it, which is obviously a Streisand effect move, although I don't think they had any other choice. Sony hasn't said anything about this yet. February 14th is a Friday. There's nothing else coming out around that time. We don't get now The Last of Us Part 2, I think, until May. We'll get Ghost of Tsushima probably in the late summer or early fall. So they have to get this game out there somewhere and somewhere in some way, in some shape, in some form. But I'm telling you right now, uh, maybe I'm going to be wrong about this. I'm going to put myself out there, though, Chris, and make a little bet. When mm-hmm. this game, com- If this game comes out February 14th, it will not be on the MPD uh, for that month. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Note that Code Vein and Man of Medan were on the MPD. For two months each, by the way. So insane. Bold guess. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and maybe it'll be like a really affordable game. Maybe it'll be like Ratchet and Clank where it's going to be like 30 or 40 bucks. But 
I don't know. I, don't I know, couldn't even, give a fuck less about this game. I really couldn't care less about this game. Just couldn't. Yeah. Just couldn't do it. And I, I really fear this might be the end of Media Molecule. And I think that's such a shame because they let themselves get cornered into doing this dumb project when they probably could have made three games in this time and given us more of not Little Big Planet per se, but Little Big Planet in, in spirit. spirit. Exactly right. Oh, look at that. Exactly right. Great minds. Chris, number four, Naughty Dog is actively hiring for a multiplayer project, even though The Last of Us Part Two has no multiplayer component. And even though that game has recently been delayed to buy the dev more time. Word comes by way of a job listing shared on Twitter by Vinit Argawal, Naughty Dog's lead game designer on The Last of Us Part Two, who also worked on Uncharted 4 and Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Interestingly, his title makes note that he's the lead game designer for both single player and multiplayer, and the listing in question seeks an online systems programmer. Chances are good that the vaguely discussed The Last of Us multiplayer spinoff is entering some sort of development, something we only heard about after fan outcry following word that The Last of Us' factions uh, multiplayer mode wouldn't appear in any form in the sequel. It's unlikely Sony or Naughty Dog will say much more beyond this anytime soon. I was a little surprised by this only because uh, Vinit Agarwal tweeted it out. It wasn't like this just appeared on Gama Sutra or just appeared on Naughty Dog's website. So there being somewhat overt that they're developing something multiplayer related, even though The Last of Us Part Two has no multiplayer mode. So it could be that Naughty Dog is splitting again, although that is weird because they needed more time to finish The Last of Us Part Two. So what do you think about all this? Yeah, I think they might be towards the end of a lot of the more strenuous i think they can get away with like i, I don't know if they're doing a, bu- a lot of meaty work on the last of us part two yet I-, I think most of that is done i think the rest of it is quality control who ironing out bugs and like making sure that it's a smooth experience from beginning to end and i think a lot of the development is probably going into this multiplayer project now i i don't know if it was really delayed out of necessity like not hmm. not to this degree. Like I, I, if they're hiring people already and they're splintering the team, like that says to me that the game is done. It's just not polished. I think that that's what they indicated, Chris, when I think Neil Druckmann was the one that wrote the letter about the delay. And he said something to the line of we, we, we talked about it at the time, but he said something like when the game when we put the game together, we realized that it wasn't done or something like that. Yeah. Right. And. Because obviously, I think a lot of people know we have a pretty high uh, intelligence audience that knows how games are made, I think. But, you know, games are made in silos and parts of games are made in silos and then they're put together. And so they put it together and they realize, well, we need a little bit more time. But it is a little peculiar that you would still publicly hire for this other project. We all know what it is. And and my, my mind is what, what I get so excited about is that it's possible factions is like some sort of free to play PlayStation 5 exclusive Last of Us tie-in that gets people involved playing on PS5 is going to be some sort of really cheap 19.99, 15.99 purchase. Um, there's a lot of possibility here. It's exciting. I just didn't anticipate that we were going to be talking about it already. I thought yeah. it was going to be something like later on we would discuss after the Last of Us Part Two came out, and and possibly even Last of Us Part Two's single player DLC, which which it might get. I don't know that it will. So. Yeah, quite a bit of interesting stuff there, but just throwing that out there for our friends at Naughty Dog, we are patiently waiting uh, for The Last of Us Part Two. Number five, the MPD Group, which tracks game sales in the United States, has released its monthly data this time for October of 2019. Not surprisingly, the month's best-selling game was Call of Duty Modern Warfare, topping the chart in only six days on the market. Perhaps a little more surprising is that The Outer Worlds from developer Obsidian and publisher Private Division came in second place. Other notable games include the contentious Ghost Recon Breakpoint at 6, the reviled WWE 2K20 at 7, Mortal Kombat 11 at 15, and Code Vein, the aforementioned Code Vein, at 18. Oh, look at that. If you reduce the charts by skew and only count PlayStation 4 games sold, the chart looks much the same with more Modern Warfare, The Outer Worlds, NBA 2K20, Madden NFL 20, and Ghost Recon Breakpoint occupying the top five. 2019's best-selling game is already Call of Duty Modern Warfare, with NBA 2K20, Madden NFL 20, Borderlands 3, and Mortal Kombat 11 rounding out the top five. Kingdom Hearts 3, The Division 2, and Anthem are numbers 6, 7, and 8. If you count the last 12 months going back to late 2019, Red Dead Redemption 2 is still that period's best-selling game. Uh, so no no big surprises there, I assume. No. Maybe The Outer Worlds kind of overperforming. Yeah, it's bit. cool. So I'm Shows that there's that. a lot of demand for that kind of game, which is neat. Definitely. Um, but really crazy that in six days, Modern Warfare became the best selling game of the year. It just goes to show you what you were saying earlier about Call of Duty. I mean, this theme is just just a phenomenon, just an absolute unmitigated phenomenon. People, everyone buys this game. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. 
And even with Madden in some of these sports games, like I was talking to my nephew the other day, he's 14, and he was talking about what games he was going to buy, and I was making some recommendations, and he went and bought Madden. I mean, it happens. Yeah, nothing wrong with that, I guess. Number six, an expansive interview with Coke Media CEO Clemens Kundratitz, conducted by Games Industry International, gives great insight into what's happening with some of the properties in its orbit, particularly at Deep Silver, the publisher now under the THQ Nordic umbrella via Coke. Telling us the obvious, quote, our strategy is an active acquisition strategy, not a merger strategy, he said. Uh, no shit. Uh, Conradditz <laughs> also spoke about a few big games in his portfolio that players are eager to hear about, like Dead Island 2 and whatever's next for Saints Row. Quote, Dead Island is a very important brand for us and we've got to get it right. It's just a testimony to our dedication to get it right. It's a great story to tell everyone that it's on its third studio, but we like to be judged on the end result. And we're really confident that when it comes out, it's going to be a kick-ass zombie game. We'll certainly give it all our power, end quote. The CEO is referencing the fact that Dead Island 2's development has shifted from Jaeger, the team behind Spec Ops The Line, to Sumo Digital, the team best known most recently for Crackdown 3, and now to Dan Buster Studios, the guys that made Homefront the Revolution. It's an, active de it's an active development with an unknown release date, though it was first revealed back in the summer of 2014. As for Saints Row, which has been largely dormant for a handful of years, Conrad had said in part, quote, Saints Row is very close to our hearts, and we'll talk about it next year. For the time being, we just wanted to get the word out that it's coming and it's going to be great, end quote. Saints Row began back in 2006 on Xbox 360 and saw a sequel as well as a third and fourth game on last-gen hardware in 2008, 2011, and 2013. Quote, we need to stay where we are. We're a publisher, developer, content creator that makes content for gamers. We're not mass market like FIFA. Deep Silver is a gamer brand, and we need to deliver on our RPGs, open-world action games, shooters. That's where we're at home. End quote. Now, I will say about Dead Island 2, Chris, what's interesting about this about this game in particular is that the developers in charge of it are actually getting worse. Yeah. That's why I'm nervous about it. It's not that it's moving around studios. It's that Jaeger is a better studio than Sumo Digital, which is a better studio than Dam Buster. That's my major concern uh, about Dead Island 2. But what do you make about all of this about Dead Island, about about uh, Saints Row, etc.? I mean, Saints Row is cool. I'm down to see another Saints Row, but uh, this Dead Island, Dead Island is going to be bad. Yeah, I, I, I so. know. For, I know for sure. Like there's no you could not convince me that Dead Island 2 is going to come out and it's going to be this incredible you know zombie experience as if we're like really hungry for that anymore um it's just not it's just not going to it's I'm sorry like it's just not yeah you think that they would cancel it or at least I don't know. They, they, he talked a little bit in that interview about their relationship with Techland and Dying Light. You know, the original Dead Island is obviously a Techland game and they really let them get away. That was like, a, I don't know what was going on there, but that was a mistake, whatever happened. You know, make, Dying Light is so much better than Dead Island, and Dying Light 2 looks phenomenal. And uh, I just feel like, why move this IP around so much? I don't know that Dead Island has that much importance or gravitas towards a lot of, for a lot of people. It's not an exceptionally important game to people. No, it really and isn't. It was just kind of this throw. I mean, it did well, but it's just kind of this throwaway game. Zombie games are like a dime a dozen now. I don't even know why you would bother. It's not 2014 anymore, 2013. I mean, it was this already is, like it was already out of date in 2014. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. And with Saints Row, I was never a really big fan of, fan of Saints Row, but it has been a while. It's been 2013 was when Saints Row 4 came out and there was some definitive editions. And of course, the Agents of Mayhem game, which bombed, which was kind of a spinoff of it. But uh, they're still going. So we'll see how that all turns out for that studio as well. Uh, volition. So yeah, some news from Deep Silver. Number seven, if Xbox's strategy with first party games needed to be proven even more, look no further because Minecraft Dungeons is coming to PlayStation 4 in April of 2020. At the very same time, the game is also coming to Xbox One PC and even Switch. The date, along with more details, were revealed at Xbox's X019 press conference. This is surprising in premise because Minecraft is a Microsoft-owned IP, and perhaps more importantly, developer Mojang is owned by Microsoft too. This isn't an externally created spinoff. Nonetheless, this is all in an all-new multiplayer-centric hack and slash, and it's obviously not the only Minecraft adventure on PlayStation, as the core game itself is not only on PS4, but PS3 and Vita, too. A more specific release date within April of 2020 will be announced early next year. We had commented during our Sacred Symbols Plus episode about XO19 that I thought this was an Xbox One and PC exclusive, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. And so it'll come day and date to PS4. I think they, I, I said it on XO19, I mean, uh, uh, the conference episode, I'll say it again, Chris, I think that game looks like a mess. Personally, I watched actually footage of it again. I was like, this game is just, it's just like a mess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not into those games at all in general. I could be, but just not, 
I don't know what was even there was just so much shit going on on the screen. I was just like, this is this seems like the anti Minecraft to me. Not yeah. in its not in its gameplay, but in its simplicity. I know yeah, it's probably it, going to be butt mashy. No, it looks it looks super anxiety inducing. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking with that. You would think that I'm sure that they're going to do it, but Minecraft Two must be like a a thing, right? That they're going to do. No, I why assume? would they do that? I don't know. Extract as much money as possible from people. Nah. Because then people are going to be like, ah, I'm not going to get a second one. This is like Overwatch 2. Everybody's like, why would they? Why? <laughs> when they when they announced Overwatch 2, everybody was like, why, why? Like, what's the point of this? Because it's like, I don't know if you read any any further into Overwatch 2 as a, as a product. But like, apparently, the player versus player mode, like the PvP multiplayer mode of Overwatch 1. Actually, that's all Overwatch is, actually. Now that I say it out loud. But apparently, that's going to be updated so you can play with people on Overwatch 2. So it's the same multiplayer but just with a but it's a new game with a campaign mode i guess like there's no reason to do that yeah i the one thing i did read about it that i thought was peculiar was that they admitted that some shit that was going to be in the original game is in the sequel in other words like they they just straight up admitted like yeah we we've taken longer on this this and this because we just put it in the second game and it's like i don't know with the game as a service i don't know that you want to even admit that yeah but it's, it seems uh it seems weird especially considering like in that space you know, you have Overwatch that kind of marketed itself as a game that was going to just sort of persist for a long time, then going like, hey, here's a sequel. And then you have Destiny, a game that's kind of predicated on having sequels, suddenly going like, hey, we're going to, this game has a five-year road span ahead of the several years it's already been out. It's like, what? Yeah, it's confusing. It's very, very strange. Yeah, this is why the roadmaps shit is just getting frustrating to me about like, roadmaps and roadmaps of roadmaps and talking about things years ahead of time. I just don't understand what the point is. I, 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 how can you even react to market realities when you're planning shit three years before it comes out? It just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense. I don't care what anyone says. You can make your game. Obviously, you're making a game three years before it comes out, but you don't need to like direct the marketing campaign that early. It's a little stupid. It's a lot stupid, actually. That's why I should be running all these companies. Number eight. At Microsoft's XO19 press conference, a release date for Wasteland 3 was announced. This may seem like irrelevant information for our podcast as Wasteland 3's developer in Exile Entertainment was purchased by Microsoft last year and is now an Xbox first party team. However, Wasteland 3 was in development for multiple platforms before the acquisition via publisher Deep Silver. And so Wasteland 3 is still coming to PlayStation 4 as well as other platforms on May 19th of 2020. In Exile's previous game, Wasteland 2 came to PS4 in the fall of 2015 and in 2017 and 2018, respectively, the studio quietly released RPGs Torment, Tides of Numenera, and The Bard's Tale 4. This was still the strangest studio that they bought, but uh, we'll see what they do in their Microsoft reality segment after this game comes out in the first half of next year. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a Wasteland fan personally, but if you're a Wasteland fan, well, if you're an old school Fallout fan, by the way, like Fallout 1 and 2, these are the same guys. So you'll want to pay attention. This is more like what Fallout was before Bethesda took the reins. Right. If you're into that sort of nerdy shit. Number nine, long in development turned long running multiplayer survival game Rust is finally coming to PlayStation 4, though the console version of the game was actually announced at Microsoft's XO19 press conference and will therefore also be coming to Xbox One at the same time. Rust originally entered early access on PC back in very late 2013, where it sold millions of copies, but didn't enter its final release form until 2018. That's the form we'll be getting on PS4. Rust was developed by British studio Face Punch, most famous for the decade-plus-old Gary's mod. Chris brought that up earlier. Developer and sometimes publisher Double Eleven, which made Little Big Planet on Vita back in 2012 and is responsible for a ton of ports and contract work outside of a few of its core products, uh, will be bringing the game over. While we know Rust will be coming to PS4 in 2020, we don't have a specific date or even month or season. Seems a little late to me, but nonetheless... Number 10, popular free-to-play action RPG Path of Exile is getting a sequel, aptly titled Path of Exile 2, and if the original game is any indication, it will be coming to consoles, including PlayStation. The reveal was made at the Path of Exile convention, ExileCon. Didn't know that existed until yeah, I read about this. Yeah, what the hell? Jesus. And its website indicates that the sequel is actually a seven-act storyline that is, quote, available alongside the original Path of Exile 2 campaign. Both the old and new storyline lead to the same shared Atlas endgame. Path of Exile 2 retains all expansion content that has been created over the last six years and introduces a new skill system, ascendancy class, engine improvements, and more, end quote. In other words, it sounds like developer Grinding Gear Games is consolidating its entire game world into something newer and fresher. Path of Exile first came to PC in 2013 and then Xbox One in 2017 and PS4 only earlier this year. 
Path of Exile 2's beta period will begin no earlier than late 2020 and will likely be PC focused at first. It's worth noting in this climate that 80% of Grinding Gear games is owned by shadowy Chinese mega corporation Tencent. <laughs> so I just wanted to throw that out there in case you guys care about that sort of thing. It seems like a lot of people do. Yeah. So if you're not into supporting Chinese companies, you don't want to support Path of Exile. Number 11, Capcom has revealed a new Street Fighter game and it's coming to PlayStation 4s in the coming months. Street Fighter 5 Champion Edition, not Championship Edition, will launch on February 14th of 2020, the same day Dreams is coming out, and has everything from both Street Fighter 5 and the arcade edition of the game. 40 characters, 34 stages, and more than 200 costumes in total, sold for only $29.99. If you own Street Fighter 5 already, however, you can upgrade for a slightly discounted price of twenty four ninety nine, you think the discount would be a little little better than that? Yeah, a five dollar discount. It's a pretty pretty garbage. That's like tax. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you think you think you'd be like you can get this for ten bucks or something like that? Yeah, that'd yeah. be cool. Greedy ass Capcom. Capcom's typically not like this actually, so I don't know. You know, they've actually been pretty consumer friendly, so that seems like a little bit of a weird one. I'll be interested to see what the uh, the vaunted fighting game community will think of that. Yeah. Number twelve. Korean developer Pearl Abyss, the studio behind cult hit MMORPG Black Desert Online, quietly announced a couple of new games that are coming to PlayStation platforms. One game is called Plan 8, described as an open world MMO shooter with an unknown release date. It will presumably come to both PS4 and PS5. The other console game of note is called Crimson Desert, a more traditional MMORPG that's also coming to console, though it's unclear which PlayStation console or consoles it will arrive on. Black Desert Online, the game that put Pearl Abyss on the map, came to PC in South Korea in 2015 and in most other territories by 2016 and arrived on PlayStation 4 very recently on August 22nd earlier this year. So the reemergence or the emergence, Chris, of the Asian studios continues unabated. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty wild. It's awesome. It's yeah. like great to see like all of a sudden like South Korean studios, Malaysian studios, Chinese studios, Vietnamese studios, you know, lots of teams we've never heard of, lots of games we've never heard of, lots of stuff coming out. Pretty cool. Number 13, Capcom's Mega Man Zero slash ZX Collection, originally slotted for release on PS4 and elsewhere on January 21st of 2020, has been delayed by a month. Capcom has revealed that the compilation will now launch on February 25th. Kazuhiro Tsushia, uh, Tsushia, I'm sorry, Mega Man's overall series producer wrote on the Capcom Unity blog in part, quote, the team made the tough decision to move the game's release date back in order to bring you the best possible collection of these cherished classics and delivery and deliver a game rather that will live up to your expectations, end quote. The Zero slash ZX collection includes six games, including GBA games Mega Man Zero, Mega Man Zero 2, Mega Man Zero 3, and Mega Man Zero 4 from 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2005, respectively, all developed by Creates. Nintendo DS games Mega Man ZX and Mega Man ZX Advent from 2006 and 2007 are also included and were also originally made by Creates. Creates, of course, is the team that since went on to create Mega Man 9, Mega Man 10, the Gunvolt series, the Galgun series, and others. So a little bit of a delay for our upcoming Capcom collection. And finally, Chris, a wrap up. Okay. Website Silicon Era reports that X Seed RPG Hero Land is coming to PS4 on December 3rd. At Microsoft's XO19 press conference, a few other multi-platform games were announced that will also be coming to PS4, including beautiful looking twin stick shooter West of the Dead and Frontier Development's Deep Sim Planet Coaster, both launching sometime in 2020. Website Push Square reports that unique management sim game Big Pharma is coming to PS4 on December 5th. That game looks really cool. <laughs> People should go check that out. It looks Sounds really unique. Cool. Developer Yacht Club Games has finally revealed the release date for the delayed piece of DLC for Shovel Knight, King of Cards, and it launches on PS4, PS3, and Vita on December 10th. If you care about the Uncharted movie that has been announced for a decade and will never actually happen, Mark Wahlberg is apparently in final talks to join the movie along co-star, and co-star alongside Tom Holland, according to Variety. And finally, Arc System Works has revealed a new Guilty Gear game for PlayStation 4 called Guilty Gear Strive, which will launch by the end of 2020. Well, look at that. Chris, it's time to get into the new game releases. But before we do, we have a letter from Cody Ho- Cody Horn, who wrote in and said, Hey, my lads, what is the deal with indie game cover art? I know many of these small teams spend several years coding away in their sweaty basement only to release their game with cover art that looks like it was mocked up by my 10 year old sister in GIMP. I know for me, at least cover art is the first thing that will grab my attention when scrolling through Steam, PlayStation Store and the eShop's bloated libraries. It seems to me that quality cover art should be non-negotiable with these indie developers. I guarantee it costs them a lot in sales um, and more than they can possibly imagine. Maybe it's just difficult for engineers to understand the importance of art to their advertising success. Your thoughts, man, the art, the art on PlayStation Store is fucking terrible. Yeah, (laughs) this is true also on Steam and on Xbox as well. 
But have you noticed any of these terrible art pieces lately that are trying to sell some of these games? <laughs> I haven't noticed them specifically, but I do know that indie games tend to have kind of... I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't think it's that all that, all that dissimilar to AAA games. I mean, I know a lot of AAA games that have just like, hey, it's a guy with a gun, you know? I remember I remember the the when Bioshock Infinite came out and it was just Booker with a fucking shotgun. And I remember being like, this is so... It's just so bland and terrible. Especially because, the, especially because the alternate cover for it is so good. It's a shame because I think that, sadly, alternate covers are like these unique covers. We should say unique covers are not typically rewarded at retail. Like, I, I often think about Resistance 3's cover from 2011. And the cover of that game is fucking rad. But it's it's Ollie Moss art of just a chimera and skull. And apparently it didn't do very well because of that. Or at least partially because of that. So right. man with white man with gun. Is yeah. typically what we see on, on these covers, and yeah, it's, it is a little much. But if anyone, including you, Chris, if you guys want to see like all the art, just go to a PlayStation Blog and look at the drop any week, and you can see some of the art that they use to like sell these games. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what some of these studios are thinking. I really don't. So it's a good point. Thank you for writing in, Chris. As tradition dictates, you will begin. All righty, debris comes to PS4, an atmospheric first-person narrative adventure set in a surreal seascape locked between ice and rock. Following an incident, you and a friend must find power, defeat strange and deadly creatures, and decipher what mysterious forces are attempting to prevent your escape. Escape together or die alone. Whoa. I think I'll die alone. Thank you. <laughs> Demo Reborn comes to PS4 and PSVR. Rayark's classic game Demo is reborn on the PS4 console with a brand new look. Having both TV and VR modes, this title allows you to immerse in the fantastical music performances and adventurous world explorations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful write-up. Aspire One VR Operative comes to PSVR. The definitive VR stealth experience, Aspire One VR Operative d d drafts... God, just don't say your name again, please. <laughs> drafts players as drone, uh, as drone operators of the future. Players become Espire agents and use cutting-edge virtual reality hardware to remote operate the Espire Model 1 from the safety of their control theater. I actually heard really good things about this. It's like, I think a friend of mine said it was like the closest we have to a VR splinter cell. I was thinking pretty, about you when I, yeah. Yeah, which is pretty, uh, it's pretty, it's tickling, it's tickling me in the right ways. It's tickling me in all the right places, isn't it? Yeah. Little pervert. <laughs> Farmer's Dynasty comes to PS4. More than just an agricultural simulation in Farmer's Dynasty, we know the name. You have to rebuild your farm and develop your heritage. Start a <laughs> develop your heritage. Start a family, handle your relationships, and of course, manage your crops to prosper. Develop your farm, your life, your family. Experience the life of a real farmer. Cultivate your fields. What's going on with the farm simulators lately? Everyone uh, loves these farm sims. I, I mean, I guess they sell. They definitely do. I mean, Harvest Moon back in the day was like a really niche thing when it began on Super Famicom and Super Nintendo. And now we are up to this point where like everyone wants to play a farming simulator. Uh, I guess a lot of that has to do with what, what was that popular farm sim? Why can't I think of the, game, the name of the game? Why can't I think of the name of that farming simulator that came that, that's like really popular that was made by one guy? Am I crazy? <laughs> the box art for... <laughs> Stardew Valley. That's it. What, what are you looking at the box art for? I'm looking at the box art for a mountain rescue simulator. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's just a guy walking. We aren't there yet. Law, law. Uh, you're up, Chris. There's, uh, there's really. <laughs> God, I hate this. All right, Lost Ember comes to PS4. A breathtakingly beautiful world holds the secrets of its past for you and your companion to uncover. Play any an play any animal. Play any animal you meet to see the world from new perspectives and chase your destiny in the exploration adventure Lost Ember. Interesting. Sounds kind of like Tokyo Jungle a little bit. A little bit. The great PlayStation exclusive that we all remember so fondly. <laughs> Mountain Rescue Simulator comes to PS4. <laughs> when danger calls, it's down to you be to become a lifesaver in Mountain Rescue Simulator. Now you and your team are in demand. Use your special vehicles such as helicopters, quad bikes, or snowcat to rescue people. Take care of broken bones or rescue lost hikers. Find and rescue mountaineers and skiers. Every sentence except for one in that entire write-up ended with an exclamation point, but I refuse to emphatically read it. Nah, as well. Find and rescue mountaineers and skiers. I don't know what's wrong. You know, with like, you. I don't need that. Jesus gotta, Christ. You gotta, you gotta get into it a little more. Too much. Too many exclamation points. It's a pet peeve of mine. Munchkin. Whoa. Comes to PS4. Dive into Munchkin. Quacked quest. What? What? 
<laughs> and rediscover <laughs> and rediscover the parody puns and humor from the hit card game Munchkin by Steve Jackson. <laughs> Gather gold, throw your foes and friends into sacrifice pits. Collect ducks, eliminate the monsters, and reach the highest level to win the game. Great. I I vaguely I think maybe have heard of this. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've definitely never heard of this in my life. Gather gold, throw your foes, and slay some hoes. That's what it should have said. Instead yeah. Because they had a little rhyme going. Yeah, it's you a know? shame. Gather gold, throw your foes, then you lost it. I mean, You definitely could have talked about slaying hoes there. Yeah. But I don't know if that's something you do in Munchkin. Narcos Rise of the Cartels comes to PS4. Narcos Rise of the Cartels. <laughs> Narcos Rise of the Cartels is a brutal turn-based action strategy game based on the hit Netflix TV series. Explore the entire first season from two sides each with their own unique story. Join the Narcos and expand the drug cartel empire or take arm, up arms with the DEA and bring it crumbling down. That actually sounds pretty cool. It's it's actually interesting though. I've been reading a lot about Narcos uh, recently since that game came out and I know that they're like doing all these like unrelated seasons of the show. Do you know that a lot of people blame that show for glamorizing like the Mexican and Central American drug trade to the point where like pe some some people think it's like normalizing it, like that these are cool people, you uh, know, that I, like, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's true or either or not, but I, I bring that up only because I think it's cool and ballsy that they let you play as the narcos. Yeah. Um, in the game. I think that's really neat. That is really neat. I don't know. If, I don't know. That whole thing is like, oh, I don't know. People people watch Breaking Bad and like liked Walter White. That's true. You know, and it's like that's a good you're point. not supposed to. But I mean, you can't you can't help that. What what's that actor's name? Uh, Walter White. Yeah, what's his name? That uh, is Brian Cranston. Can I, Ryan Cran right, Brian Cranston. Yeah, I really liked him in uh, Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah, I liked him in Seinfeld. Yeah, uh, he's an anti dentite in the uh, or no, he's no, not. He's, he's the, the dentist. The, no, he's he's the dentist. Right. He's the dentist that converts to Judaism. <laughs> For the little, jokes. little little schmear of fluoride. <laughs> God damn it, Shenmue three. <laughs> Shenmue 3, long awaited, uh, comes to PS4. Journey deep into rural China as you take on the role of Ryo Hazuki. I think I said that right. Yeah. A Japanese teenager hell bent on finding his father's killer. A story of adventure, mystery, friendship, martial arts, and ultimately revenge. He's still a teenager after all these years. I know. It's been, all, it's been what, 18 years since Shenmue 2, but he is still a, teen, a young teen. I always think about um, that, like, like how old Bart Simpson's soul is. Oh my God, dude. How long has that boy been in elementary school? Uh, Since 1987, that boy's been in elementary school. I wonder if you took all of Bart Simpson's screen time over the last, the, over the entirety of the show, whether or not it would amount to a full, you know, year of school. Right. <laughs> a full secondary's worth of education or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, I well, wonder. Someone should do the math on that. Yeah, I'm sure someone has. Yeah, I won't pay you or anything, but like, I mean, you should. No. No, we're definitely not going to pay you for that. Uh, by the way, Shenmue 3, just a quick uh, note. I don't think either of us are going to play it, but did you see this thing about how they uh, they originally made the embargo date three days after the game came out? And everyone's <laughs> like, you can't do that. Like, that's not because at IGN, we wouldn't we wouldn't accept any embargo that was after it came out. No. So course. like, if someone tried to give us a game, we'd be like, that's they'd give us a game and be like the embargo is three days after it came out and be like, yeah, OK. And then we would just publish the review when it came out anyway. So. Yeah, Shenmue, they eventually moved it back to release date, I guess. And I'm really eager to see how this game does. It's uh, it's not looking good if they're putting the embargo three days. That's usually a pretty good sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah think about it. Death Stranding's embargo was like eight days before the game came out. So, yeah, it's always it, it's I don't know when publishers are going to realize that game um, enthusiasts are savvy enough to know that embargo dates typically indicate the internal competence of a project. And. Actually, in that Deep Silver interview that I brought up earlier, because Deep Silver is publishing Shenmue 3, it was hilarious because he said something like, the CEO said something like, you know, we're going to do our best <laughs> with the game. I'm like, all right. Uh, Sid Meier, Civilization 6 comes to PS4. Yeah. Explore a new land, research technology, conquer your enemies, and go head to head with history's most renowned leaders as you attempt to build the greatest civilization the world has ever known. Civilization 6 for PS4 includes the latest game updates and improvements, including four new civs, leaders, and scenarios. I fucking love Civilization. So I'm really interested to see. It's like one of the only reasons I ever play PS4, or um, PC rather. Yeah. So, and it makes my, my laptop sound like it's about to take off and go to space. <laughs> so I'm really excited to see how this plays because it's not civilization revolution it's the real version of the game which we've yeah. never gotten on console i don't think i actually think we had civilization on ps1 but 
in many recent years, we've never gotten a real civilization game. And I'm such a big fan of those games. It's funny, Chris, because I was thinking about this yesterday. We've gotten to this weird inflection point where I play PlayStation and then I play PC games when the exception occurs. But a lot of those exceptions are migrating the PS4, not the other way around. So what we thought was going to happen where like a PC centric future was going to eventually dominate for all of us is actually going in the opposite direction, which pleases me. Yeah, maybe uh, as a console gamer, especially as, uh, you know, consoles become more open to different inputs. I feel like you're definitely going to uh, like definitely 100 percent like next generation. Uh, you're going to be able to use mouse and keyboard. Like, on your, yeah, like on you, your, you like ubiquitously. Yeah, yeah I agree. I'm, I'm I agree. certain of that. Anyway, uh, what are we? Uh, what am I? Uh, sniper Ghost Warrior Contracts comes to PS4. Experience pure sniper gameplay across the harsh terrain of Siberia in a brand new contracts-based system that encourages strategic thinking. Playing as a silent assassin within engaging? Mm -hmm. Redeployable missions. We oh, okay. Right. I see. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I'm actually... So I'm not a huge fan of Sniper Ghost Warrior or Sniper Elite. The... You know, like, those are the weird games where you have to, like, track the arc of your bullet and shit it's like really complicated but this set like or at least too complicated for me like i really wanted to like the latest sniper elite game and i'm like i can't do this yeah. you know where like the bullet is arcing and you have to like n use a little knob on your i'm like you kidding uh but this sounds this sounds cool because it sounds like hitman but as a shooter which pleases me actually yeah. a great deal and so I think I might pick this one up. This might be one of those uh, holiday games that I sit down and play with because I would love an idea of like repeatable missions in a shooter world that's not trying to tell me like World War II story or whatever the fuck is going on in some of these other games. So yeah. this sounds cool. It sounds like it's score based or, or you know, letter grade based or whatever. So we'll see. Yeah. Are you alive? Yeah. It's up to you. Oh wait, what do you mean? Didn't I just? Oh, do that? oh, 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 no, I'm sorry. That's up to me. Hey, you psycho. Dustin, you can keep. You, yeah, I am. Well, yes, I am. <laughs> Stretch comes to PS4. This is the shortest uh, write-up I've ever seen on PlayStation Blog. Yeah. Stretch Arcade is a retro-style reaction time trainer for all skill levels. You know what? We can make fun of that, but that tells me all I need to know about the game. Yeah, it it actually does. It's very judicious with its words. I appreciate. Alrighty, that. and I got the. Jesus, I got the longest one. I think. The Curious Tale of the Stolen Pets comes to PSVR. Experience an interactive tale of childlike wonder. Help your child <laughs> help your grandfather solve the mystery of the stolen pets by exploring wonderful miniature worlds crafted from the ground up for VR. Use a hairdryer to melt snow in a wintry landscape. Search the wreck of a pirate ship partially hidden under the surface. Every world is unique, full of interactions and colorful life using a hair dryer to melt snow sounds like uh you getting electrocuted waiting to happen yeah i'm just being yeah. honest with you actually also your grandfather in this game uh is just senile and has uh alzheimer's so you're just running around doing nothing in that game i think <laughs> all right chris let's end with six questions comments concerns thoughts and ideas from the audience as we always do each week beginning with brent linquist says hey fellas i'd love to hear your takes on the press release put out by remedy this week regarding control sales Apparently, there's some confusion around the revenue split between Remedy and 505 Games' parent company, Digital Brothers, along with the Epic Game Store exclusivity deal. It also sounds like there may be some disparity between the methods used by Remedy and Digital Brothers to record sales. Is this just desperate damage controllers control really in a better spot than we thought? No, this... Did you see this? No, I this have no idea what that means. This is weird. So let me see if I can actually pull this up. Yeah, here it is. So they released a press release, Remedy did entitled clarification regarding the control game sales revenue recognition uh, and it says in part the publishing partner of remedy blah 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 released their first quarterly report of the financial year that started in july 2019 the report also covered the revenue recognition blah, blah, blah. on may 3rd 2017 remedy announced the signing of a publishing agreement with digital brothers regarding the control game and disclosed remedy re to receive 45 percent of game sales net revenue so uh, that revenue share is calculated from net sales. So for people that don't know, the, the big argument here is net versus gross, which I'm sure a lot of you don't know the difference between if you're not a business owner. But gross money means or gross sales means money, just cumulative money made before expenses, before you pay anyone, all that kind of stuff. Net sales or net revenue is how much money you have left over after everyone is paid and all of your bills are paid from the product. So apparently this discrepancy in whatever was reported by uh, 505 and Remedy had to do with net versus gross sales, but we see that the game didn't re re um, didn't arrive on MPD, and that 
those numbers are independently reported and garnered, so they're not from the publishers necessarily. Yeah. I think a lot of the digital sales are. So it could be possible that the game sales are lower than or higher than we think, but I don't think so. I think this was probably something Remedy and 505 had to do for their shareholders. And I don't think this was even directed at enthusiasts. Like I found this link on Global Global Newswires, which or Globe Newswire, which is um, just a collection of any press release you could possibly imagine. So really weird. Yeah. So I don't think that it was even meant for anyone to notice except for their shareholders. And remember, Remedy is a European company, so they're not even speaking to American shareholders necessarily with this, too. So there's a whole nother disconnect there as well. Um, no, I think that it's pretty clear that the game bombed. And that's unfortunate because I think it was a pretty cool game. And as we talked about, Chris, on XO19 Sacred Symbols Plus episode, it seems like Remedy is getting back into bed with Microsoft because they're making... Uh, unknown to me until last week, and I think yeah. unknown to anyone, they're making the, the single player for Crossfire X. Exactly. Weird. Super Which, weird. Uh, Crossfire X is a Korean developed multiplayer shooter that is coming to Xbox One only, not the PS4, and Remedy is making the campaign for it. So they're back. And uh, I feel like that's a sign that it didn't work out very well, uh, leaving the safety of that ecosystem, but I could be wrong. None of their games sold very well, by the way, since Max Payne. So it's not exactly that unusual, but yeah. it's not like Alan Wake was like this big earth scorcher of a game. Yeah, no, they've always, they've always made really solid games for a very kind of, they, they've, they made them for remedy audiences. I think they're, they're, they're not like a naughty dog. And it, 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 it stands to, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true or not. It might be the same with Insomniac with PlayStation audiences, but it stands to reason that, Remedy's audience might just be on Xbox. But if that were the case, we would have seen the game pop on Xbox's MPDs, which we didn't. So I don't know, guys, but yeah, I think Control bombed. We didn't we didn't hear anything from anyone about how Control did. So you damn well know it bombed yeah. because these guys, these guys are these guys will tell you anything <laughs> to make it look like their game sold well. Uh, and that's not just 505. That's literally anyone. Todd, wait until by the way, wait until our game comes out and, and I tell you guys how well it's sold. I'm just going to keep talking about it. I'll probably just make shit up to him. Todd B. Canning wrote, up, uh, wrote in and said, hey, CNC Podcast Factory, do you think there might be a PS4 buyback program to help push people to the PS5? I know I could be swayed to join the PS5 sooner than later if I got a little something for my four. What do you guys think? This is an interesting idea, Chris. I think he's talking specifically with Sony, like an official thing, as opposed to a retailer centric buyback, which happens, I think, every generation. Do you think that this is something that Sony could could push forward? No, yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah, no way. What would be the point? Like, what I I know the point would be to get people on PS5, but what would Sony do with the PS4s? That's my big thing here. I was thinking about this. Like, what would they do with these these ancient components? They're useless. They're worthless. No, exactly. Like, there's no point. I think uh, I think you're more likely to see the the typical retail stuff. That is most likely going to happen. Definitely. And I think that the retail deal. See, here's my thing with the retail deals. You usually see. I don't think they're going to be as compelling, because of the forwards and backwards compatibility that's just baked in now. Yeah. So selling a PS4 doesn't really mean much because they're not going to be able to sell PS4s as easily as when they would have been able to say, like say PS3s at the beginning of the PS4 era, because now you can just own the PS5 and play everything. So I think that that's going to be problematic. Yeah. Maybe they, maybe there won't even be a, uh, maybe they'll just be like, Hey, just buy our console, idiot. Yeah. Well, I'm talking more on the retailer level though. Like, right, right. Like when they're selling brand new PS4 standards for two hundred dollars with three games a year out from PS5's launch, how much is your PS4 going to be worth in a year? Nothing. Yeah. I mean, that's the sad, that's the sad reality. And I'll remind you guys, and I've said this so many times: don't sell your hardware. For the love of Christ, stop selling your hardware. You know, sell software. I think that's totally fine, but keep your hardware. Yeah. Why are you selling your hardware? You know, I just don't. I and I don't understand. I think you should keep your hardware. I think it's important to keep your hardware. Officer Friendly wrote into us and said, hey, <laughs> East Coast Colin and Krusty Chris. Everyone loves calling you Krusty. I don't like that. With PS5 coming down the pipeline, it got me wondering about the PS3 and Vita store. Will we ever have access to that storefront again? Will Sony eventually pull the plug and shut it down? God knows PS3 era Sony had no idea what it was doing with online infrastructure. I think about this a lot as well because the PSP store is still alive via the Vita if you want to use it that way. Like you can download a PSP game on Vita as long as it's compatible with it. And the PS3 store still works too because as we talked about a few months ago, I went on it. And, and boy, did I go on it. It was yeah. uh, something else. So how long do you think that we'll have access to these stores natively? My assumption is, is that 
the Vita and PS3 stores on a native PS3 and native Vita might go for like another decade or longer, just so they don't have to deal with people bitching. Uh, I think so. About yeah. Everything at all times. I think you're probably right. I don't know about a decade. I think it's a decade. I, I think another. I think probably once this next generation is relatively established and they know that people are like people who have PS3s have probably either migrated to PlayStation 4 by that point, maybe if it's a cheaper entry point. I think at that point, they'll probably be like, OK, this thing is no longer. The, I, I wonder. It's weird, too, because we've never had to worry about this kind of thing. Like, this is the first time we're going to have we're going to have three different storefronts. You know what I mean? Like right, from, exactly. from several from from different generations That's operating true. at the same time. We've never had to deal with that. We've had one. Obviously, when the Xbox 360 and the PS3 launched, we had one store. And then the next one was like, OK, well, it stands to reason that the previous one would be around. But I don't know how feasible or reasonable it would be to keep you know, the oldest storefront still running. I wonder. I want to look here. You know what a great way... Sorry, I'm bumping my mic. I know that's coming through to people. A great way to keep track of game and that, like when the last time a game came out or something like that, it's not so useful for PS4 or Vita because there's still a lot of games being announced. But if you go to PSN profiles and then you go to the games list and you order them by when games came out, FIFA 19 was the last PS3 game to even be released. And that was well over a year ago. And then NBA 2K18 before that. And then before that was Rainbow Skies, which came out the week that we launched Sacred Symbols. So Jeez. those are the last three PS3 games. And it it does make you wonder, like, well, how many people are even playing this shit? Like, for instance, now you have to connect your profile to, to, um, to PSM profiles to get counted. So it's not counting everybody. But FIFA 19 on PS3 has 839 owners on PSM profiles. To put that in the context... Grand Theft Auto 5 has 1.12 million people playing it on PSN profiles on PS3. So big difference um, in the amount of people yeah. playing these games. I don't know exactly how it's all going to work out, but uh, I would think that they either need to make the PS3 store work with PS4 or they'll shut that down really soon. But I, I personally think that if the cost is cheap and the up and, and they don't really have to keep everything up, they're not uploading games to it anymore. It's just there. Why not just keep it? Yeah. You know? I assume there's some level of server load, though. Like, everything costs money. So, like, I assume it's... I wonder... My thing is, it's like, I wonder if their solution to backwards compatibility will just be an emulator for the PS3 store. Whether or not you could, like, just connect to the PS3 store from, you know, from your PS5 or whatever. Although that would be a little convoluted. I mean, I think that they got to fold everything into one store. But I still think that the PS3 emulation is is the the best way we're going to or the only way we're going to get it, obviously. See, I'm I'm just stealing myself much like you are, Chris, to just be totally disappointed on the backwards compatibility front completely. Yeah. You know, with like their weird, we're working towards it verbiage and the just complete yeah. throwing away of the PS3. We're working to achieve. Yeah. Great, guys. That's great. The console comes out in less than a year. You're going to have to start manufacturing them next summer. So I think you should be working to achieve it a little quicker. That's my feedback. <laughs> I mean, they're going to start manufacturing these things probably in like July. And you're, you know, probably no later than that. Yeah. To, to get them ready. So you would think that they'd have to have this thing finalized like real soon. Yeah, like no, real definitely. soon. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Maul wrote in like Darth Maul. I don't I think Darth Maul is dead. I don't know, though. Hey, CNC. What is a title that is not available on PlayStation that has your interest? And have you ever considered branching into PC gaming at all? It's more accessible than ever, and the PS4 controller works natively with it, and Steam has amazing controller binding options. Uh, love the podcast. Thank you, Darth Maul. Appreciate you. Yeah, this is definitely this is definitely more of a you question since I... I yeah, I was going to say... I, uh, well, I was going to say it's more of a you. It's funny you look at it that way, because I look at it as more of a you question. We, talk, we talked a lot about it a little bit earlier with Civ 6. I don't play PC games. I just... I like playing on one. Chris is much more agnostic than I am. He's actually completely agnostic. I'm not. Uh, I like playing on PlayStation. I don't think that means I'm a fanboy because I call it as it is. But I just like having I can only wrap my mind around so many things at once. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And PC gaming is not like I don't have steam on my laptop right now. I, I, I think I have like seven different steam logins because I can't even remember how to log into my steam account. Like I think I have like Civ five on one steam login and like steam si or Civ six on another and. So that just goes to show like, I, don't, I haven't logged into my Xbox Live account since Gears of War 3. So <laughs> that's a while ago. Yeah, which I think was like 2011 or something yeah. like that or 2012. So, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not much to, to venture in. But Chris, how do you kind of decide how to spend your your time between 
you're not much of a Switch guy, although I've seen you play Switch actually on more than one occasion, but you're an, a PS4, Xbox One, PC guy. And you have, we should point out, uh, you have our collective Epic Games login, so you get free PC games galore. Um, yeah. So that's worth noting as well. But how do you balance all that time? I just, uh, how do I balance the time? Yeah, like how do you how do you know where to go? Oh, I don't know. I, th- I feel like I pick based on, honestly, input. A lot of the time, like if I if I play an FPS, typically I'm gonna want to play it on my Xbox One X just because I feel like it's gonna be a little bit smoother. It is stronger generally, and also I just like the offset sticks for shooters. If it's a platformer, I typically stick to like Switch or PlayStation. Uh, obviously, PC is a little bit more, you know, customizable. So if I'm playing like a, an FPS where it's like, oh, the FOV is a bit a, a bit small on console, I'll play it on. PC or whatever. It's honestly Destiny Two is like the best thing ever because I get to play it wherever. It's so good. But uh, I don't know. I just sort of I just sort of go with whatever feels. Right. Like I'm playing Fallen Order on my Xbox One because I saw a fr- my roommate got it on uh, a base PS4 and it looked kind of like eh. And obviously, like I figure, oh, the Xbox One X is relatively strong compared to the rest of it, and it looks great, obviously. But like I just sort of I'm kind of all over the place, honestly. There's no rhyme or reason to any of it. I just kind of feel like uh, I feel like using this controller for this game. That makes sense to me. I'm too OCD to like split my attention anymore. Yeah, I used to be able to do that. I think the last generation that I really, truly played all three consoles in quotes was the PS2 Xbox GameCube era. I don't think it's really happened since then for me. So that was a weird one, too, because every controller was significantly different. Right. And a lot of the games also. I mean, there were so many games on all three of the consoles. I'd, I'd, I'd say more than ever. I mean, everything was on all three consoles, with the exception of like your random exclusives. And PS2 was actually the one that had the fewest meaningful exclusives, in my opinion. I was all about the GameCube, that generation. I fucking love that thing. Yeah. Tony Colton wrote into us. This is actually the final question. The sixth question I'm reading ahead. Uh, Clark Petrie wrote into us about Shenmue 3 and the embargo, which we already talked about. So oh, I right, beat fair. you to the punch. Uh, but Tony Colton wrote in with what is the final question. He says, hey, CNC, wondering if you can clear something up. How are games classified AAA, AA, Indie, etc.? What does this shit actually mean? Is Death Stranding an indie game because Kojima Productions is an independent studio? Please make my brain understand. You right. know what this reminds me a lot about, Chris? This is a great question, first of all. It reminds it's like me a lot about... adventure mode, right? <laughs> like, or like adventure games or whatever that yeah, is? It, yeah, we had that conversation just a few weeks ago about genres. And it also reminds me of the old term downloadable game, which yeah. we really struggled with when I was at IGN because back in the day... 10 years ago, eight years ago, I think even probably seven or six years ago, we would give away awards and separate them based on if it was a downloadable game or not. And then we started to have conversations like, what the fuck does that mean? I mean, when PS4 came out, everything was downloadable. So then we had to ask ourselves like, well, what do we do with these downloadable games? We used to think about that as like Limbo or Shatter or something like that or Stardust. And so we stopped using that term. And I think we should stop using the term for the most part indie game. I know I use it. Chris uses it. We all use it. But it does cause confusion because, yeah, Death Stranding. Well, no, Death Stranding is not an indie game. It's published by Sony. Um, An indie game is really published and developed by an independent developer, independent studio. But those are meaningless terms now, too, because Insomniac, for instance, was an independent developer. Remedy is an independent developer, but you wouldn't call Control an indie game. So it is complicated. For what it's worth, double A is not really a term in gaming. It's triple A and then A. And that's typically judged based on the the provenance of the studio and the, and the publisher and uh, the cost of the game. So in a good A game like Ratchet and Clank is an A game because it was 40 bucks, but it's first party. It's not independent, even though Insomniac made it when they were not owned by Sony. Does that make any sense? I don't know if it does. It does. But. It's just a it's a whole fucking mess, honestly, like the way we the way we label shit. It's just kind of like all over the place. I personally feel like when I when I hear the word indie game, I think of I think of Limbo. I think of like stuff like the dishwasher or like mm. uh, which is like a really obscure thing. to. Yeah, mention. it's an Xbox 360 game. What? Yeah, right? that was an old like arcade like hack and slash Metroidvania. That was actually super good and like super weird uh, stuff like that. But like Death Stranding is obviously a triple A, <laughs> obviously a triple A game just because the concept of it is like unconventional doesn't necessarily make it an indie game, uh, even if it is an independent studio being published by Sony. It's, it's weird, man. It's it's really bizarre. Yeah, the death, I understand what he means about the Death Stranding example, but that's a bad example just because Guerrilla worked on that in, in addition, which is a first party studio. And Sony is arguably the biggest publisher of games in the world right now in terms of quality. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand what he's saying. And this is why we have to be, this is why I love being specific about language because we do have to figure out ways to talk about these things. And I use the term AAA and A all the time. And I kind of in my head know what that means. But I understand if people don't know what that means. And I especially know that because today because there aren't that many A games anymore. Yeah, like, there's really. no The, the mid tier is gone. It's slowly coming back. THQ Nordic is slowly bringing it back, which I think is a positive thing. But we don't really have that that interstitial yeah. space anymore where you would get your random ass, not high quality, high production games. Like we were talking about Naughty. When we talk about Naughty Bear last week, that's yeah. a great example of an A game. Yeah. 505 there published. Of, there were a ton of A games, man. Like uh, Destroy. Yeah. I think I'd argue Pandemic was like the best A game studio. Like they made like the, some of the best games that weren't triple A. Like they were so good. Like Destroy All Humans isn't a triple A game. It's not an indie game either. Right. But, exactly. That's a great example of another one. Yeah. So we'll figure this out. Well, you know, I've always thought about this probably exists. I'm not smart enough to have come up with this idea first, but we have to have some sort of shared vocabulary and like some sort of gamer dictionary or I don't know what it would be where like these are the terms and these are what they mean. And that would be fun. I mean, that th those kinds of things exist in other in other fandoms, actually. And like these agreed upon terms and. They're just more, you know, when you think about games or comic, or I'm sorry, when you think about movies or comics or something, these are more mature industries. So, of course, they would be a little bit further along. But we have to have some sort of shared vocabulary. We're not going to understand what we're saying anymore. And, and it really does remind me a lot of the whole downloadable game thing. I remember not too long ago when people were like, I won't play downloadable games. I won't buy downloadable games. You know? Yeah. It's like, well, you're dumb as shit then because you're missing out on a, lot, on a lot of really great stuff. No one makes that argument anymore. But I remember really having arguments with people back in the podcast beyond days and stuff like that, where they're like, I won't play a PSN game. And it's like, well, why not? Why won't you? And yeah, now here we are. Well, I remember back in the day, like I kind of felt that way. Not necessarily like I would play like Limbo and stuff like that. But then there were other games like <laughs> like Fortress Craft. Or stuff like that, where like you would you would feel like, oh, okay, this is what a PSN game is, or this yeah, is what like yeah. this is what an indie game on a console is like, because for so, even even back when those games were more or less the same or like considered in the same kind of ecosystem, there was some line where there was like you had kind of not AAA indie but like quality indie, and then you had like just the real muck, <laughs> just like that's true. You know, so yeah. I don't know, man. I remember <laughs> this is a, literally a this is a real thing. I don't know if it was on PlayStation or not, but I remember <laughs> going through the indie, uh, the indie store on Xbox Live during the 360 generation. I think it was probably, probably around 2009 or 2008, where I was like looking through and I found literally just uh, a game that just made your controller a vibrator. Like, actually, for real. Like, I'm not even, that's not even a joke. It was like some, like, put the controller in your back and it's a, it's a massager. And it's like, yeah, okay, sure. It's real sick. Real yeah. cool. Put it on your dick. <laughs> and it's also a massager. What was that thing they had on uh, Xbox for a while that was pretty, actually pretty ahead of its time? The independent game developing scene? You know, the, it was like, it was not the Xbox 360, like, lot, like store or anything, but it was like people making independent games and just putting them up. Oh, as they wanted. Son of a bitch. Yeah, I think that's what I was looking at. Yeah, yeah. Because I knew someone that released a game on there too. Yeah, yeah. That was like basically like a party game, like a spinner. Oh, son of a bitch. I, I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember it either. I feel but like yeah, it's kind of. Well, let's end on that note. All right. Shall we? Chris, I appreciate your time. Of course. And uh, we'll do another episode. Actually, next week's episode, I'll be in Virginia next week. So that'll be the first time we do an episode. Uh, well, actually, no, we did an episode when you were in New York. So that's not true. We weren't that. We were far away before when we did it. I'm lying. I, I thought it was going to be our first like cross <laughs> cross uh, country episode, but it's not. The, so aneur never mind. the aneurysms have uh, slowly begun to take. Yeah. Hold. Yeah. I got to get out of here. I got to find my center again. So, uh, Chris, appreciate you. Appreciate all of you out there. Thank you so much for your love, your kindness, your support of our show. Remember to support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early ad free access to this show. The ability to access Sacred Symbols Plus, the ability to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas, and to support us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you next time for more Sacred Symbols and Sacred Symbols Plus. Until then, goodbye. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product of and a registered trademark of Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded right here in sunny Santa Monica, California, USA. This show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Raygun. You can find me on Twitter at NoTaxation and on Instagram at CLS Moriarty. 
Chris is on Twitter at Chris R. Gunn and on Instagram at Chris underscore Ray underscore Gunn. Sacred Symbols is edited by Dustin Furman. Any snail mail can be sent to the CLS P.O. Box, P.O. Box 1233, Santa Monica, California, 90406. To message the show online, please use Patreon's DM service. As you know, all of Colin's Last Stand shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and we are eternally grateful for your kindness, generosity, and fandom. Chris Adams, Carlos Algarit, Morgan Ashley, Saul Balcazar, Taylor Barkley, Martin Beck, Tyler Bello, Mark Boggio, Barrett Boswell, Spencer Brand, Miguel Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Eric R. Brown, Jason Budnick, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Dylan Burns, Chris Buston, Nick C., Alex Cabrera, Patrick Harper, William O'Carroll, Brian Chan, Sean Chandler, David Chestnut, Rodney Coleman, Simon Conception, Brad Cooley, John Cordero, Gio Corsi, Nick Cottrell, Philip Crone, Daniel Diamore, Colin Davenport, Knight Draft, David Ellis, Jerome Ferreira, Joe Finelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Rudon Fitzpatrick, Patrick, Chris Galvin, Connor Gashian, Alex Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem El Ghanem, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Miranda Grubba, Jonathan H., Eric Harden, Tyler Harris, Richard Hebert III, Kyle Hagel, Shane Hendrickson, Wyatt Henry, Robbie Hensley, Scott Hernandez, Asa Haas, Johnny Humphreys, Blake Israel, Azan Isa Al Ricey, Josh Yeager, Garrett Jagger, Joshua Jonathan, Paul Joyce, Greg Julius, Anton Kay, Patrick Kelly, Jeremy Key, Antti Kinnanen, James Kinslow III, Ryan R. Kittredge, Mason Kodolak, Jackson Lastiqua, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Matthew Lenz, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Lou and Ray Loper, Colin Love, Scott Lovelace, Josh M, Kiet Mai, Ryan T. Mandel, Ross Maranka, Matt Martin, Sean Mason, Jordan Moss, Zachariah McAdoo, John McCarthy, Josh McKinney, Joe McPartland, Raul Melendez, Andrew Mendoza, Chris Moore, Betty Ann Moriarty, Ryan Murdoch, Adam Nix, Donnie Nolan, Dan Nolan, George Anthony Nunez, Jesse Owen, Jorge Palomino, Andrew Parker, Zach Parsley, Daniel Parsons, Marius S. Peterson, Gerald Pennington, Matthew Perdue, Enrique Perez, Jason Pettit, Travis Travis Plymouth, Jeff Pollard, Lawrence F. Prokop, Nathan R., Ryan Reeves, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Mark Richardson, Daniel Rivas, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, Jose Salinas, John Schultz, Michael Shanholtz, Toby Schutman, Joshua Smallwood, Ahmad Tamar, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Alan Tremblay, Michael Vecchio, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Connor Walton, Isaac Wastman, Damon Weathers, Mike Wayant, David Wright, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zuniga, Bloody Fang, Homeworld Hub, Gamer Filmaholic, Mega Debt, IQ Train, Throw 7, McDog 18, Infinite, Organic Produce, Mad Mock Media, Not Your Real Dad, Mubarak, Craft Heads Podcast, Richter86, Hugo's Desk, Andrew, Ian, Chris, Dav9834, Rainick, and Casual Misfits Gaming.